good evening ladies and gentlemen anka daha den samudh jan balavegen kolambi innuma kone eram kurunagala district ke jeshtha nayakatwaya jc alawatwala anka hata samagi jan balavegeya Mamat Ekagai, S. Marika, Anka Atta, Kolumbadi Strikia, Samagi Jana Palavegia. Dahana Bea Yanu was who said a good and a go, Achare Harsha the Silva, Anka the High Samagi Jana Palavegia, Kolumbadi Strikia. Covid situation. and i think it's we we have come to a time that we have to start thinking differently and maybe start thinking out of the box and you know like i actually represent like the political side over here you know and you know there are uh, academics and you know people who are far more qualified than me to uh, address you um but speaking on the political side in general i think um we should not forget the political culture and you know like how um, the country is progressing after the last presidential election we are starting to see the same kind of uh, nepotism and the regular you know like deterioration of uh, rule of, rule of rule of law and same kind of things that we uh, used to see we, that we used to see uh, before or pre 2015 era um if we are going to you know like brush over like a few things that i would really like to you know bring to your attention would be how things have deteriorated you know i'm not going to talk about cost of living and you know like all these average points that you know we always seem to you know hack on uh, the political arena but i would like to bring to your attention you know things like how freedom of speech has been affected and um, how a person's right to protest which is a basic democratic democratic right that you know we should you know everybody in a democratic a society should um, expect and you know demand because we are starting to see um, protests are being violently subdued and on top of that i would like to bring to the attention how media and freedom of speech is being affected and everything is being covered up under this cloud of um, covid fear because what i would really like to bring to your attention is the actual points because this government this government seems to be suppressing actual issues by minor issues that they have created by themselves you know like because these days the thing that we talk about the most unfortunately is uh, the 2011 cricket uh, fiasco <laughs> you know if i may call it that because i really don't see that as like a real issue i think you know it's a government attempt at uh, misdirecting us and taking our attention from actual points you know like things like uh, what i mentioned you know freedom of speech and i would like to specially bring to your attention what happened during that uh, suicide of uh, of a journalist who actually uh, let me call it had the audacity to uh, say that uh, the airbus deal that uh, lost so much, such a lot of money for to us was directly linked to two princes of this country and they have made it look like a suicide and they called it a suicide and but if you really looked into it i think there are a lot of things that we really missed you know like i i won't go into details but that suicide ha has so much such a remarkable resemblance to tajuddin's accident you know because those days they used to call it an accident and now you know they are calling this a suicide so i i really do not think it was a suicide i think it was a message to anyone who is willing to speak up or talk against this government's corruption this is nothing different to you know like the same rajapaksa modus operandi of pre 2015 era so bringing that into mind i think we should really see what is the message they are trying trying to send the message as i see it is to anybody who's willing to talk or you know speak up against this government 
and to say that if you ever talk against us, we have the power and the ability to bring you into the same, uh, independent square and maybe shoot you in the mouth, <laughs> right? So these are things I think you know, we should really consider going forward. I know we are facing a lot of challenges um, because of the, this COVID situation, but we should not overlook what is really happening in this country. Because we are facing a totally different kind of problem. Because the topic for today is post-COVID economic and financial issues. Yes, you know, that is a huge problem. Because we are seeing, after a long time, we are seeing a huge uh, slump in our stock market. And most our jobs are threatened. Not my political jobs, but you know. Uh, what's, uh, what actually matters in this country. And we are seeing a lot of things like pay cuts, layoffs, which can have like a huge and a very long-term effect on our economy. Because most countries like, countries, like some countries like Japan, they actually did not shut down, even though they had the resources to shut down. We went, for a shut, went to a shutdown, maybe a little bit too late, but Kudos to the government, I think, or more than the government, I'd say, you know, security forces and our healthcare staff. I think we managed it quite well. But I think now we need to start thinking on how to get back on track. And to do that, I don't think, you know, like as politicians, we have much of a clue. That's the first thing I think we need to admit. Because politicians always have the attitude that, you know, that we know everything, which is quite wrong. And as my young friend over here said, that we are going to need the support, the advice, and the help of the professional community and the youngsters of this country to come up with novel ideas that are different and, again, out of the box. Because, see, when it comes to pay cuts and layoffs, I think we are going about this the wrong way. I got this point uh, from actually one of my friends and, you know, like actually listening to him. You know, he's a... Uh, someone who's high up in the financial markets. I wouldn't want to mention his name. But I think he came up with a very novel idea, which I shared uh, recently as well. He was telling me, instead of going for pay cuts and layoffs, let's come to a system where we can substitute the pay cut with maybe offering stock options and company rights, which will actually motivate people to live with maybe a little bit less with a hope that someday that when the company starts doing well that they will start doing well as well so i think that is like a very nice idea but you know that did not come from me that came from people like you so i think we need to start listening to you more and start talking less maybe because when it comes to these kind of things, I think public, especially the youngsters of today, they have a better idea than we do. Because normally we don't really get the time to actually keep up with the times. You know, we are, we are too, in, too involved in our politics and you know, we are too involved in the political game. But, see, I think we should start listening. And I know this has been hacked so many times, you know, like every government, you know, like before they come into power or, you know, whenever we go into an election. We did this uh, during the last election as well, you know, like we promised the professional community, we promised the youngsters that they are, we are going to give them a platform, we are going to listen to them, that, you know, we are going to do things differently. But nothing really changed, did it, you know. It was, again, the same politician, it was the same bunch of people doing the same things. So I think we need to move away from that. Hopefully, I believe under the leadership of our leader, Sajit Premadasa, we might actually have a chance in doing so. So coming back on to the two topics I, you know, I would just want to brush over because I want to really cut, cut my uh, speech short because I don't uh, want to take too much of your time and I would really like to hear Dr. Jan, Diane Jayatilaka and uh, Madam uh, Inoka Satyangani and actually you know, maybe give you guys an opportunity to talk on these points and you know, maybe come up with you know, 
give us some idea of what you know how we should move forward so one point i want to talk to you about would be how this government as i was telling before even is trying to maybe take our mind away from what's actually happening in this country one thing when it comes to economy it comes to the economy i think you know like what we should really talk about this was only like brushed over on um, most media channels which was the loan that was taken by bank of ceylon from the china development bank it was somewhere on the amount of 140 million us dollars so if we really look at this think what has happened because you know when it comes to um, credit scores sri lanka is not in a good place we are seen these days as defaulters and our leaders are going around the countryside or around the world saying you know we are having a hard time paying this off so instead of borrowing directly to the government what they did was they borrowed it through the bank of ceylon which has a better rating when it comes to credit than sri lanka as a country so what really happened here what they did was they actually mortgaged basically it's a mortgage of the bank of bank of ceylon and its assets to the china development bank and they will tell you beautiful stories about how they are going to use this or utilize this money i think you know the biggest thing they are going to say is we are going to give working capital loans to small and medium industries so that they can ride this covid wave and you know get past it but really think about it like has this ever happened this money is going to go directly into government's projects and you know whatever they want to do i would really like to bring your attention to enterprise sri lanka the loan system that we were offering to you know uh, motivate uh, business in the country really think about it how many people do you know that you know actually got that loan i know a lot of people who spent a lot of money developing you know the documentation which was like you know they were asking for everything but you know like to get that documentation going or even it cost people nearly you know sometimes half a million 1 million depending on how much you are asking but how many people did really get it even during our government it was a marketing and a political gimmick same thing is happening right now this 4% working capital loan i ask i would really ask you to you know go and ask your bank managers whether you can get it and if you are going to get it what documentation are they going to ask and if they if you are if you want how much are they willing to give they are going to cover your basics like you know some salaries electricity bills and uh, water and you know all other utilities but what happens to your rent right what happens you know like you need a working capital and past let's say four and a half years hasn't been great you know it was a really bad time for business how are we going to address that and main point is when you mortgage a institution like bank of ceylon and when you only put it on media for like about 5 seconds what really happens we don't really pay too much attention to it and that has been overshadowed by this whole poor sangha being brought to question that's what what we are talking about unfortunately as a race i think i be, i believe that we have like a very short attention span we are very easily misled and misdirected so by mortgaging a institution like bank of ceylon where mostly their customers are people from the villages that is the most dangerous part of it if it was like a bank that you know people in colombo is dealing with they would even pay attention but poor people in the villages they would real wouldn't really know what's happening because most of the savings and assets are mortgaged to bank of ceylon and when you go into these kind of loans with other countries especially with nations like china their conditions you can bet are going to be horrendous because they would always demand their payments first and if it comes to you know like a li like liquidating the bank to pay off loans they would always take their share first what will happen where is this going to hit the hardest it's going to hit our rural economy where where most of our poor people are depending upon 
So it's a very, very dangerous situation. So what I would really like to bring to your attention is, or you know, ask you to do is start, as I think uh, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa said, start looking at the big picture, but not his big picture, the actual big picture. Because we are at a very dangerous place. So we as a community, especially the intellectuals and the youngsters of this country, I think, need to come forward. Because we need to change this whole idea of we are going to vote once a year, once every five years, and then you know, whoever we are going to vote is going to take care of everything. And you know, it's totally their responsibility, and it's not ours. Understand this. I know you understand it, but you know, I want to emphasize on it. If you vote for somebody, it is your responsibility. Whoever you bring into parliament is your responsibility as well. If they cheat, if they steal, you are part of it. You cannot wash your hands by saying, no, we only voted for them. If you voted for someone corrupt, if you helped a corrupt regime to come into power, you are more responsible than anybody else. You should be the first ones to speak up. I know, you know, like you are supporting us, but even if we start doing something wrong, I, I would really like to see you, guys, you, know, you guys actually standing up against that. Because at the end of the day, you are responsible. I'm going to talk about one more point, and then you know, I'm going to open the floor to my more intelligent, more smarter, educated colleagues. So last point is another point that they have hidden inside this cricket and you know all these other things that we are focusing on. That would be 5-2001 um, Government Gazette. I think most of you might be aware of it. It is about giving smaller forests, not big jungles, the rights of smaller forest to the forest department. So if, you, if anyone was to acquire any of that land, it has to go through a special committee in the forest department. Now, understand this, these are forests that are like about 500 acre hectares or less, which actually helps preserve most of our bigger forests and jungles. So what they're trying to do now, they have brought in a gasset, asking to cancel that former gasset, which took the power away from uh, divisional secretaries and governors to release that land on their own accord. Right? If you cancel it, the power goes back to the uh, district secretariat. So one letter from a politician or a minister can, minister or president, can, you can, the divisional secretary can actually release those lands. And current thing, current uh, idea about it is that apparently there is five multinational companies lined up who are asking for those lands for development purposes. The reason the government is giving is not that. Government is saying that, you know, we need to help the poor farmers, you know, we need to, you know, better utilize these lands. But that is not actually the truth. Because if they wanted to do that, there is a provision for that. I think that cassette is called 2 slash 2006 cassette, which says any part of these um, peripheral jungles that is not utilized, not, not, you know, not utilized, but you know, doesn't have any fauna or growth, like bare lands, can be released. There is no problem in doing that. You do not need to cancel the 5 slash 2001 gasset to, do, to help farmers. You need to do that only if you want to give it to multinational companies in huge scales to actually rape those precious treasures that we should be actually conserving for our next generation. Because, see, apparently, uh, Mr. Basil Rajapaksa is behind this, but, uh, well, it's nothing new, is it? You know, because last, during the last election, one of the biggest platforms, you know, they were standing on was uh, Mr. Risha, uh, uh, Minister Richard Badruddin's and that Vilpattu issue. But, you know, we kept saying that, that happened during their time. They were the ones who actually gave them, the, gave the right to uh, violate those lands. 
So the same thing is happening again now, but the government is taking our attention away from all that by creating their own issues and themselves solving it a few days later. So we really need to start looking at the big picture, but not the one that they are trying to show you, the actual big picture. And I think it's people like you, leaders of industry, people who are respected, that should come forward and talk about these things and you know make your voice heard. Because as politicians, whatever we say goes as you know political agendas and you know things as things like that. So I think this is a very good forum, but we need to remember that we need to keep this going even after the election. I know this has been said so many times. So I hope you know there's going to be a recording of this and you know if by any chance you know I get elected. And if I don't do anything, I think you guys should take this and start playing it. And you guys actually have a responsibility to keep, keep pushing us to do the right thing. Once again, please do not just vote. When you vote, look at the big picture. Our manifesto will be coming out very soon. Most manifestos will be coming out very soon, within this week, most probably. Go through them very carefully and just don't be don't blindly follow question them because you guys are smart enough to do it the average joe of this country is not they will read it and they will believe it always ask how why those are the most important questions as i see it so after saying that once again i thank you all for your time and for the organizing committee for giving me this time and I hope I will be here until the end. I hope you know we could you would raise some hard questions for us and maybe give us some good advice on how to go forward. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you very much uh, Mr. Vimalaratna. I think um, Mr. Vimalaratna touched on key topics of nepotism, the depression of freedom of speech, and most importantly, the loans that were taken recently from China and so on, and also being a recipient of the Arab Boomer scheme initiated by the previous government, the solution is quite simple, which is a state guarantee. That's what is required for businesses to get these loans, which right now the liquidity is quite flooded in the market itself. And also, uh, for sure, uh, Mr. Vimal Ratna, we are a professional group and it was created with the intention of creating a nationwide movement, a global movement, and certainly we will push you. And we also wish you well and we hope you get elected as well. And uh, so next we have uh, Ms. Inoka Satyangani Keetinanda uh, and uh, she will more or less touch on the topics of women empowerment. As we know, women contribute the highest revenue to this country and uh, also we recently witnessed the appointment of a female CEO, Kasturi Wilson as the CEO of a conglomerate, so herself being a, a chairman of a state-run media organization. I think she will talk on the effects of and also on methods at which we can get more women participation into leadership roles and driving them under uh, SJB government. Uh, Inoka, it's up to you. Acharya Dayan Jayathilek Mahata, Sahodar Anuradhvi Malaratna, Ethulu Feminicity Noba Sirudhena Atama Subha Sandhya Vakke Vakkelema Prathana Kanna. Ethulama Adha Maathruka Avata Anuva, Apita Salakana Tavilaati Enne, Covid Pandemic Enne Passe, Prate Aarthike, Himanathana Loka Aarthike, Idhiriyata Gaman Karanne, Kuhumadha Kiyana Karanne. Ethulama Apivage Rataka, විශේෂයෙන්ම මේ මාතුකාව ගැන කතා කරද්දී අපිට ඉස්සෙල්ලාම බලන්න වෙනවා මේ රටේ තියෙන කර්මාන්ත, කෘෂි කර්මාන්ත සහ සේවා කියන ඒ අංශ තුනෙන් 
රටේ ඉන්න ශ්‍රම හමුදාව සහ අනිකුත් වෘත්තිකයන් කොහොමද මේ රටේ ජාතික ආර්ථිකයට යමක් එකතු කරන්නේ කියලා සහ රටේ ඉන්න පාලන තන්ත්‍රයට ඒ ජාතික ආර්ථිකය ගොඩනැගීම සඳහා විධිමත් සැලැස්මක් වැඩපිළිවෙලක් විශේෂයෙන්ම දීර්ඝ කාලීන වැඩපිළිවෙලක් අඩු තරමින් ඔවුන් බලයේ සිටින කාලය තුළ දීවත් ඒ වෙනුවෙන් විධිමත් සැලැස්මක් තියෙනවාද කියන කාරණේ මම හිතන්නේ මුලින්ම අපිට සලකා බලන්න වෙනවා මොකද ඇත්තටම අපි දන්නවා මේ කොවිඩ් පැන්ඩමිකයත් එක්ක දෙදාස් දහනමේ අපි නින්දට ගිහිල්ලා අවදි වෙච්ච මිනිසුන් හැටියට නෙමෙයි අපට දෙදාස් විස්සේදී මේ ලෝකයට ඇස් අරින්නට වෙන්නේ ඊට වඩා ඉතාමත්ම වෙනස් වූ ඉතාම ව්‍යාකූල වූ පරිසරයක් අපි ඉදිරියේ අපි කැමති වුණත් අකමැති වුණත් මැවිලා තියෙනවා එතෙන්දී සාමාන්‍ය මිනිස්යන් විදිහට සාමාන්‍ය පුරවැසියන් විදිහට අපිට තියෙන ලොකුම අභියෝගය ජීවත් වීම හුඟක් අයට ඉහළ මැදින් පාන්තික මැදින් පාන්තිකයින් ඇතුළු සියලුම දෙනාට පොදුවේ තමන් කරන කිසියම් ව්‍යාපාරයක් වෘත්තියක් හෝ වෙනම් ඕනෑම කටයුත්තක් විශේෂයි ඒ ගැටලුව පැන නගිනවා මොකද අපි පෙර හිටපු තත්ත්වයට වඩා අපිව යම් කිසි වෙනත්ම ස්තරයකට ඇදල දාලා තියෙන තත්ත්වයක් තුලදී මෙතෙන්දී අපි මුලින්ම සලකා බලන්න ඕනේ ලෝකයේ හුඟක් වෙලාවට බහුතරයක් රටවල් වල මේ තත්ත්වය පොදුවේ බලපානවා විශේෂයෙන්ම අපේ රට දිහා අවධානය යොමු කරනවා නම් මේ ශ්‍රම හමුදාවට ඇහින් නැත්ත මේ ශ්‍රම හමුදාවට අයිති සාමාජිකයන් කවුද කියන කාරණේ අපි මුලින්ම හඳුන ගන්න වෙනවා ඒ අපි ලංකාව දිහා බැලුවොත් මොකද ලෝක මට්ටමෙන් අපි විග්‍රහ කරද්දී ඒක බොහොම විශාල චිත්‍රයක් ඒක සම්බන්ධයෙන් මම හිතන්නේ ආචාර්ය දයන් ජයතිලක වගේ කෙනෙක් වඩා සාධනීය පැහැදිලි කිරීමක් කරයි නමුත් අපි මේක ලංකාවට ආදේශ කරලා බලනවා නම් අපි දන්නවා ලංකාවේ ජනගහනෙන් 151.7 ක් ඉන්නේ කාන්තාවන් එතකොට මේ කාන්තාවන්ගෙන් 136ක් වගේ සුළු ප්‍රමාණයක් තමයි ඇත්තටම ශ්‍රම හමුදාව තුල තමන්ගේ කාර්මික සහ කෘෂි කාර්මික අංශය කෙරෙහි මේ ශ්‍රම හමුදාවේ බලය පතුරවන්නේ. එතකොට එවැනි තත්ත්වයක් තුලදී ඉතිරි පාර්ශ්වයන් හුඟක් වෙලාවට කරන්නේ තමන්ගේ නිවෙස් තුලට වෙලා ගෘහණියන් හැටියට, බිරින්දෑවරුන් හැටියට, එහෙම නැත්නම් මව්වරුන් හැටියට තමන්ගේ සාමාන්‍ය ස්වභාවයෙන් පැවතීම පමණයි. ඇතරම විශේෂයෙන්ම දැන් අපි අද දවසේ මුහුණ පාලා තියෙන මේ ආර්ථික අර්බුදෙත් එක්ක ලංකාව වගේ රටකට මේ සඳහා මං හිතන්නේ ඊටම අවශ්‍යයි මේ නිහඬව ඉන්න කාන්තා පාර්ශ්වයන් ඉදිරියට ගෙනල්ලා රටේ ආර්ථිකයට සාධනීය දායකත්වයක් එකතු කිරීමට. දැන් මෙතෙන්දී අපි මේක මේ දර්ශක තුලින් අපි පොඩ්ඩක් තරමක් දුරට විග්‍රහ කරනවා නම් ඇතරම ලංකාවේ තියෙන පුරුෂයන් හා ස්ත්‍රීන් හතර ස්ත්‍රී පුරුෂ සමාජ භාවයේ මුල් කරගත්ත මේ ආර්ථික බලයේ තියෙන විභේදනය ඒ කියන්නේ ඔවුන් දෙපාර්ශ්වය අතර තියෙන ආර්ථිකයට දායකත්වයක් ලබා දීමේ ඇතිවෙන පරතරය ලෝක මට්ටමින් බැලුවාම 14 වෙනි ස්ථානයේ ස්ථානගත වෙනවා ඒ කියන්නේ අපි ඉන්නේ ලෝකයේ රටවල් 195ක් අතරින් 14 වෙනි තැන මේ ස්ත්‍රී පුරුෂ සමාජ භාවයේ ඊටම ඉහලින් සලකන සහ කාන්තාවන්ට තමන්ගේ රටේ තියෙන ආර්ථිකයට දායක වෙන්නට තියෙන ඉඩකඩ පිළිබඳ තියෙන ගැටලුවේ බරපතලම අවස්ථාවක් තුල තමයි අපි ඉන්නේ. එතකොට එවැනි තත්ත්වයක් තුලදී ඇත්තටම ඉදිරි කාලය තුලදී මෙතනින් එහාට අපි ඊටම දරුණු ආර්ථික අගාධයකට ඇද වැටෙමින් තියෙනවා මම හිතන්නේ ඒක කවුරුත් දන්නවා. ඊටම තද බල විදිහට රටේ උද්ධමන වේගය ඉහළ යනවා. එතකොට ඒකත් එක්ක රටේ කර්මාන්ත කඩා වැටෙනවා. අපි අනුරාධ සහෝදරයා කලින් කිව්වා වගේ හෝටල් කර්මාන්තය, සංචාරක ව්‍යාපාරය, එතකොට සේවා සැපියුම් ආයතන ඇතුළු බහුතරයක් මේ කර්මාන්ත ඊටම අනතුරුදායක තත්වයකට පත් වෙමින් තියෙනවා. එතකොට අපි ඒ සියල්ල මැද්දේ අපේ රටේ පාලකයින් මහ බැංකු නිලධාරීන් හෝ එහෙම නැත්නම් රටේ ඉන්න ආර්ථික විශේෂඥයින්ගේ අදහස් වලට කන් නොදී 
මුදල් මේ මුද්‍රණය කිරීම ඊටම සීග්‍රෙන් කරගෙන යනවා ඒ තුල ඔවුන් කිසිවෙකුටත් මං හිතන්නේ නෑ මේ උද්ධමනේ පිළිබඳ හැඟීමක් තියෙනවා කියලා මොකද ඔවුන්ට අවශ්‍ය වෙලා තියෙන්නේ මේ මොහොත තුල තමන්ගේ බලේ පිහිටා හිඳීම සහ රටේ ඉන්න ජනතාව අත්‍යාසන්න මැතිවරණයක් ඉදිරියේදී තමන්ගේ මතයට නම්මා ගැනීමට මේ මොහොත තුල කළ හැකි ඕනෑම කටයුත්තක් කිරීමයි ඉතින් එවැනි තත්වයක් තුලදී අපි බොහොම නුදුරු දිනකදී ග්‍රීසිය වගේ තත්වයකට ඇද වැටෙන්නට සෝරි පුළුවන් මොකද අපි දන්නවා ග්‍රීසියේ අද මේ මොහොත වෙන විට මිලියනයකට අධික පිරිසකට මුළුමනින්ම රැකියා අවස්ථා හිමි වෙලා තියෙනවා ඒ වගේම ඉරට සෑම පුරවැසියන් හතර දිනෙකුගෙන් එක්කෙනෙක්ම විරේකියාවෙන් පෙලෙනවා ඒ වගේම දැන් අපි මං හිතන්නේ හුඟක් බහුතරයක් දන්නේ නැතුව ඇති දැන් මේ මොහොත තුළ අපි මධ්‍යම ආදායම් තත්වයේ ඉඳලා රටක් හැටියට අපි පහළ මධ්‍යම ආදායම් කියන තත්වයට ඇද වැටිලා තියෙනවා ඒවා එළියට එන දත්ත නෙමෙයි ඉතින් එවැනි තත්වයකදී ලෝකයේ ආර්ථික විශේෂඥයන් ප්‍රකාශ කරලා තියෙනවා මේ පහළ මධ්‍ය ආදායම් කියන තත්වයට ඇද වැටිච්ච බොහෝ රටවල් ඉදිරියේදී පස් දෙනෙකින් එක්කෙනෙක්ටවත් රැකියාව අහිවීම අහිමි වීමේ අනතුරකට මූණ දීලා ඉන්නවා කියලා ඉතින් මෙවැනි තැනකදී අපි අර මම අර කලින් කිව්වා වගේ කාන්තාවන් මේ ශ්‍රම හමුදාවට එහෙම නැත්නම් රටේ ආර්ථිකය ආර්ථිකයට රටේ රටේ තියෙන අනිකුත් කාර්ය බහරයන් සඳහා ඉතාමත්ම සාධනීය ආකාරයෙන් දායක කර ගැනීම මේ මොහොත තුල අතිශයින්ම වැදගත් වෙනවා නමුත් ඒක සම්බන්ධයෙන් කියද්දී තියෙන අවාසනාවන්තම තත්වය තමයි එක්දාසම සිය අනූ පහේදී බීජිං ප්‍රකාශය නිකුත් කරලා ලෝකයේ කාන්තාවන්ට තියෙන අව තක්සේරු කිරීම එහෙම නැත්නම් ස්ත්‍රී පුරුෂ සමාජ භාවය පිළිබඳව තියෙන ගැටලු මගහැරීම ආදී කාන්තාවන් විෂයෙහි දැක්විය යුතු ගෞරවය සහ අවධානය පිළිබඳව ලෝක සම්මුතියක් ඇති කරගෙන දෙදාස් විස්ස වෙනකොට අවුරුදු විසිපහක් ගත වෙනවා දෙදාස් විස්සේ සැප්තැම්බර් මාසේ වෙන විට බීජිං ප්‍රකාශනය අවුරුදු විසිපහක් සපුරලා තියෙද්දී අද මේ මොහොත වෙනතුරුත් අද ඔබ ඉදිරියේ මා අමතර මේ මොහොත වෙනතුරුත් ලංකාවේ තාම කාන්තා ප්‍රඥාප්තියක් අපි එළි දක්වල නැහැ දැන් ඇත්තටම එක්දාසම සිය හැත්තයාටේ මුලින්ම කාන්තා කාර්යාංශය කියන දේ ලංකාවේ එළි දැක්වලා ඒ කාන්තා කාර්යාංශය තුලින් කාන්තාවන්ගේ අයිතීන් සහ හිංසනයට පීඩාවට පත් වෙන කාන්තාවන් විෂයෙහි ඔවුන්ට දක්වන්නා වූ නීති රීති පද්ධතියක් මේ රටේ පැවති යුතුයි කියන තීන්දු අරගෙන ඒ සඳහා එක් දසම් සිය අනූ තුන පමණ වෙන විට කාන්තා ප්‍රඥප්තියක් ගොඩනැගීම සඳහා මූලික පදනම දවන්නට එවකට හිටපු රජය පියවර අරගෙන තිබුණා හැබැයි ඒ මූලික ලේඛනයෙන් පස්සේ එහි අදහස් විමසීමට මහජනතාවට ඉදිරිපත් කරලා අවස්ථා ගණනාවකදී මහජන අදහස් විමසලා ඒ පිළිබඳව නැවත තීන්දුවකට එළඹෙනවා කියන තත්වය මත ඉඳගෙන අද මේ කතා කරන මොහොත දක්වාත් මොකද ඒක මං දැනුවත් වෙලා ඉන්න විදිහට දෙදාස් හතේ තමයි අවසාන වතාවට මහජන අදහස් සඳහා එම ප්‍රඥා ප්‍රඥප්තිය යොමු කරලා තිබුණේ එතකොට එම තත්වයේ ඉඳන් අද අපි මේ කතා කරන මොහොත දක්වාම අදටත් කාන්තා ප්‍රඥප්තියක් රටේ ස්ථාපනය කරලා නැහැ එතකොට දැන් කෙනෙක් කියන්න පුළුවන් ඇයි කාන්තාවට පමණක් මෙහෙම ප්‍රඥප්තියක් කියලා මොකද අපි දන්නවා ලෝකයේ හැම තැනම කාන්තාවන් බහු බහුතරයක්ම දෙවන පන්තී පුරවැසියෙක් හැටියට සලකන වාතාවරණයක් සමාජ වටපිටාවක් තියෙනවා ඒක මං හිතන්නේ මේ රටට පමණක් සීමා වෙච්ච දෙයක් නෙමෙයි නමුත් ඒ කාන්තාවන් විෂය පවතින ගැටලු වලට කිසියම් කියන්නේ විසඳුමක් ලබා ගැනීමට නම් අඩුම තරමින් ඔවුන් විෂයෙහි පැහැදිලි නීති තත්ත්වයක් රටේ පැවති යුතුයි එතකොට ඒ ගැටලු හඳුනාගෙන ඒ නීති සඳහා කිසියම් වූ පදනමක් රටේ ස්ථාපනය නොකර ව්‍යවස්ථාපිත මට්ටමින් ඒ සඳහා පදනමක් දාන්නේ නැතුව මං හිතන්නේ අපි කොච්චර කාන්තා ගැටලු ගැන කතා කරත් ඒකෙන් වැඩක් තියෙයි කියලා මොකද අපි හැමදාම මේ ප්‍රශ්නය ගැන කතා කරනවා ශ්‍රී ප්‍රචණ්ඩත්වය ගැන කතා කරනවා මම හිතන මෑතකදී ඉතාම දරුණු විදිහට අපි දැන දැනුවත් වුණා මේ පහුගිය කෝවිඩ් මේ කාලය තුලදී කාන්තාවන් කොපමණ ප්‍රමාණයක් නිවෙස් තුළ ඒ කියන්නේ ගෘහස්ථ මට්ටමින් තමාගෙම සැමියාගෙන් ප්‍රචණ්ඩත්වයට ලක් වුණාද කියලා නමුත් ඒ සඳහා වෙනම පනතක් තිබුණත් 
ඒවා නැවත නීතිය හමු වේ ක්‍රියාත්මක වීමේදී ඊටම අවම තත්ත්වයක් තමයි පවතින්නේ. ඉතින් මේ සියලු දෙයට මං හිතනවා ඊටම වැදගත් වෙනවා මේ කාන්තාවන් සම්බන්ධව විධිමත් වැඩපිළිවෙලක් ක්‍රියාත්මක කරන්නට ඒ පිළිබඳව මූලික හඳුනා ගැනීම කළ යුතුයි කියලා. දැන් හඳුනා ගන්න නැතුව ප්‍රශ්නයක් ඒ සඳහා විසඳුම් හෙවීම මං හිතන්නේ හරිම මේ කියන්නේ ඒක සිද්ධ නොවෙන කාරණයක් මොකද ඉස්සෙල්ලම ප්‍රශ්නේ හඳුනා ගන්න යුතුයි. එම ප්‍රශ්නේ හඳුනා ගන්නවා නම් ඒ ප්‍රශ්නේ සඳහා විසඳුමක් පැවති යුතුයි. එතකොට දැන් මම කලින් කිව්වා වගේ මේ කාන්තා ප්‍රඥප්තිය කියන්නේ කාන්තාවන් විශේෂී ගන්නා වූ සාධනීය ප්‍රතිපත්ති මාලාවක් වෙනුවෙන් පදනමක් දැමීමයි. නමුත් අවාසනාවකට කිසිඳු රජයක් හුඟක් වෙලාවට කාන්තා කටයුතු අමාත්‍යාංශයේ හැම වෙලාවෙම කාන්තාවක් තමයි ඇමතිවරිය හැටියට කටයුතු කරන්නේ. ඒ කියන්නේ එහෙම හිටපු කාන්තා ඇමතිවරියන්ට මම ඇඟිල්ල දිගු කරනවා නෙමෙයි. නමුත් ඔවුන් එසේ සිටියදී පවා දිනෙන් දිනම මේ තත්ත්වය දිග්ගැහිලා ඒක දවසෙන් දවස ඒක ක්‍රියාත්මක නොවන මට්ටමකට තල්ලු වෙලා තියෙනවා මිසක් ඒ කාර්යභාරය අද වෙනතුරු සිද්ධ වෙලා නැහැ. මෙවැනි පසුබිමකදී තමයි 2019 ජනාධිපතිවරණ මැතිවරණ ප්‍රකාශයේදී සමගි ජන බලවේගී නායක සජිත් ප්‍රේමදාස මැතිතුමා කාන්තා ප්‍රඥප්තියක වටිනාකම හඳුනා ගත්තේ. ඒ තුලින් ඊටම විධිමත් ඊටම සැලසුම් සහගත ප්‍රතිපත්ති මාලාවක් සකස් කරා විතරක් නෙමෙයි ජනාධිපතිවරණයේ අවසන් වෙලා එතුමාට ඒ කටයුත්තට අත ගසන්නට බැරි වෙච්ච හින්දා මොකද බලාපොරොත්තු වෙච්ච විදිහට බලයට පැමිණෙන්න නොලැබිච්ච හින්දා මෙවර මහමැතිවරණයේ වෙනුවෙන් කාන්තා ප්‍රඥප්තියක් ලේඛනගත කළා තියෙනවා ඒක බොහොම නුදුරු දිනකදී අපි ජනගත කරන්නට සූදානම් ඉන්නවා එතකොට මේ කාන්තා ප්‍රඥප්තිය එළි දැක්වීම තුලින් මං අර කලින් කියපු ප්‍රශ්නය ඒ කියන්නේ මේ රටේ ඉන්න කාන්තා පාර්ශ්වය රටේ සංවර්ධන ක්‍රියාවලිය වෙනුවෙන් ඉදිරිපත් කිරීමට තියෙන ශක්තිය මොකද්ද ඒ ප්‍රඥප්තිය තුලින් කියන පැනය නැවත අපි ඉදිරියේ තියෙනවා මේ සඳහා අපි මේ මොහොත වෙන විට මම හිතන අද දවසේ මම මේක මේ සභා විදිරේ කියන්න බොහොම වගකීමක් සහිතව තමයි පැමිණියි මොකද මේ මොහොත වෙන විට අපි දැන් සති කිහිපයක් මුළු ලේම මමත් ජාලි ප්‍රේමදාස මැතිනියත් එකතුව අපි කණ්ඩායමක් කාන්තාව කණ්ඩායමක් එකතු වෙලා ගමින් ගමට ගිහිල්ලා ඒ කාන්තාවන්ට තියෙන ප්‍රශ්න සාකච්ඡා කරමින් මේ කාන්තා ශ්‍රමය රටේ ආර්ථිකයට දායක කර ගැනීම සඳහා කිසියම් වැඩපිළිවෙලක් ඉදිරියට අරගෙන යනවා ඒ වැඩපිළිවෙල තමයි මේ මොහොත තුලදී ගෙවල් වල ඉන්න කාන්තාවන් දැන් මොකද අපි දන්නවා හුඟක් වෙලාවට ආසියාතික රටවල කාන්තාවන් දැන් යුරෝපීය බටහිර රටවල වගේම බැහැරට ගිහිල්ලා රැකියාවන් කරන එක තද ප්‍රවණතාවයක් බවට පත් වෙලා නැහැ මොකද හුඟක් වෙලාවට මැදියම් පාන්තික සහ පහල මැදියම් පාන්තික කාන්තාවන්ට එක්කෝ රටේ තියෙන මේ කියන්නේ රැකියා ගැටලුව වුන් ඉදිරියේ මතු වෙනවා එහෙම නැත්නම් වුන්ගේ අධ්‍යාපන සුස්සකම් මදි වෙනවා එහෙම නැත්නම් තමන්ගේ සැමියා හෝ පෞලේ ඥාතීන් කියනවා එළියට ගිහලා රස්සාවක් කරන්න අවශ්‍ය නැහැ ගෙදර ඉඳලා ළමයි බලා ගන්න කියලා ඉතින් එවැනි ප්‍රශ්න එක්ක කාන්තාව හැම වෙලාවෙම මේ නිවස ඇතුලේ තීර පරිසරය තුල තමන්ගේ දායකත්වයේ දීලා ඒකෙන් සෑහීමකට පත් වෙනවා ඉතින් මේක හැමදාමත් අපි විවිධ තැන් වලදී හඬ නගලා කියලා ඕක පිළිබඳව මැසිවිලි නගනවට වඩා මේකට ප්‍රායෝගික වැඩපිළිවෙලක් සකස් කරන්න අවශ්‍ය හින්දා අපි සූදානම් වෙලා ඉන්නවා මේ මොහොත තුල මේ ගෘහයේ රැඳි ඉන්න කාන්තාවන්ට විශාල රැකියා අවස්ථාවක් ගොඩනගන්නට පදනමක් දමන්න ඒ තමයි අපි කියන්නේ දැන් ගමින් ගමට ගිහිල්ලා විවිධ කාන්තා කණ්ඩායම එකතු කරගෙන ඒ කියන්නේ 100ක් 200ක් පමණ එක තැනකට ඒක රාශි කරගෙන අපි ඔවුන් එක්ක සාකච්ඡා කරනවා ඇයි තමන් රැකියාවක නිරත වෙන්නේ නැත්තේ කියන එක. ඉතින් එවැනි තැන් වලදී අපිට මතු වෙන විවිධ කාරණා ඔස්සේ අපි ඔවුන් එක්ක සාකච්ඡා කරලා ඔවුන් ගෘහය තුල සිටිද්දීම ඒ කියන්නේ අපි තුම් මවක් ලෙස එහෙම නැත්නම් සමහර දියණියක් ලෙස සමහර මිත්‍රණියක් ලෙස වුණත් තමන් නිවස තුල සිටිද්දී තමන්ට අපි අවස්ථාව ලබා දෙනවා ඒ එවැනි කාන්තාවන්ට ව්‍යාපාරික ප්‍රජාවන් එකතු කරගෙන ගෘහස්ථ මට්ටමේ සුළු කර්මාන්ත අත්කර්මාන්ත තුලින් තමන්ට ආදායමක් උපයා ගන්න. දැන් උදාහරණයක් හිටිට අපි කියමු දැන් පහුගිය කාලේ පුරාම 
හඳුන්කූ රුවගේ නිෂ්පාදනයක් ඉන්දියාවෙන් සහ වෙනත් ආසන්න රටවල් වලින් මේ රටට ආනයනය කරා. මොකද අපි දන්නවා අපේ අදටත් නිෂ්පාදන ආර්ථිකය කියන එක ඊටම පහල තැනක තියෙන එකක්. ඒ සඳහා කොතරම් විධිමත් ක්‍රියාමාර්ග ගන්නවා කියලා කිව්වත් එක්කෝ විදේශ ආයෝජකයින් ඇවිල්ලා මෙහි ආයෝජනය කරලා මහා පරිමාණයේ කර්මාන්ත ශාලා විවෘත කරන්න ඕනේ. එහෙම නැත්තම් මේ රට තුල ඒ සඳහා ඊට ප්‍රස්තාව ලබා දෙන්න ඕනේ. එතකොට ওই කාරණා දෙකම සිද්ධ වෙන්නේ නැත්නම් මේකට අපේ රටේ තියෙන ආර්ථික සම්පත් එක්ක ප්‍රායෝගික වැඩපිළිවෙලක් සකස් කිරීම අත්‍යවශ්‍ය කාරණයක් වෙනවා. ඉතින් එතෙන්දි තමයි අපි තීරණයක් ගත්තේ දැන් මම අර කලින් කිව්වා වගේ හඳුන්කුරු නිෂ්පාදනය දැන් මෑතකදී වර්තමාන පාලන අධිකාරිය විසින් තහනම් කර ආනයනය කිරීමට. එතකොට මෙහි නිෂ්පාදනය වෙනවා කොහේ හෝ කර්මාන්ත ශාලාවක කාගේ හෝ ඒ කියන්නේ අධිකාරිත්වයක් යටතේ. නමුත් ඊට වඩා අපි කල්පනා කරා ගමින් ගමට ගිහිල්ලා මේ සුළු කර්මාන්ත එහෙම නැත්නම් ස්වයන් රැකියාව සඳහා ඉදිරිපත් වෙන කාන්තාවන් ඒක රාජ්‍ය කළා රටේ ඉන්න විවිධ ව්‍යාපාරික ප්‍රජාවන් එක්ක අපි අත්වල් බැඳගෙන මේ කාන්තාවන්ට මසකට සැරයක් ඒ බඩු අපි ලබා ගන්නා විදිහට අපි හිතමු එක්කෝ පපඩම් ව්‍යාපාරය වෙන්න පුළුවන් එහෙම නැත්නම් සුළු මට්ටමේ කියන්නේ ආයිත්තම් නිර්මාණයේ වෙන්න පුළුවන් එහෙම නැත්නම් මූණු ආවරණ වෙන්න පුළුවන් නැත්නම් මම කලින් කිව්වා වගේ හඳුන් කූරු වෙන්න පුළුවන් අපි එවැනි අංශ ගණනාවක් හඳුනාගෙන ඒ සඳහා ඉදිරිපත් වෙන කාන්තාවන් වර්ගීකරණය කළා. ඒ සඳහා උන්ට පුහුණුවක් නැත්තම් දැනුමක් නැත්තම් අපි විශේෂඥින් අරගෙන ගිහිල්ලා ඒ කණ්ඩායම් වලට ඒ පුහුණුව ලබා දීලා අර ව්‍යාපාරිකයන් හා එකතුව ඔවුන් ගෘහයේ ඉඳගෙනම මේ බහන්න නිෂ්පාදනය සඳහා යොමු කරන්න. දැන් එතෙන්දි මතු වෙන එක ප්‍රශ්නයක් වෙනවා. දැන් කොහොමද මේ සඳහා වෙළඳ පළක් අපි නිර්මාණය කරන්නේ කියලා. මොකද හුඟාක් අයට තියෙන ගැටලුව තමයි බහන්න නිෂ්පාදනයේදී විශේෂම සුළු කර්මාන්ත විෂයෙහි වෙළඳ පළ තත්ත්වයක් නැති වීම. එතෙන්දි එක සංකල්පයක් තමයි අපි අරගෙන ආවා. මේ ගුඩ් මාකට් කියන සංකල්පය මේ දැනටත් අඩු වැඩි සහිතව තියෙනවා. ඒ කියන්නේ මාස මාස මසක් පුරා මේ කාන්තාව නිෂ්පාදනය කරපු බහන්න අපි එක තැනකට අරගෙන ඔවුන්ට යම් කිසි වෙළඳපල නිදහස් වෙළඳපල තත්ත්වයක් ගොඩනගලා ඒ තුල තමන්ගේ බහන්න අලව කිරීම. ඊට අමතරව දැන් යම් ව්‍යාපාරිකයෙක් ඉදිරිපත් වෙනවා නම් මේ මට්ටමේ යම් තමන්ට අවශ්‍ය නිෂ්පාදනයක් මේ කාන්තාවන් හරහා ගෘහස්ථ මට්ටමේ නිෂ්පාදනය කරගන්න ඒවා එක තැනකට අපි ඒක රාශි කළා තුක වශයෙන් ඔහුට පුළුවන් ඒවා අවශ්‍යනම් ආනයනය කිරීම දක්වා සරි සමාවෙන්න අපනයනය කිරීම දක්වා ඒක වර්ධනය කරන්න. ඉතින් එවැනි තැනක මූලික වැඩපිළිවෙල අපි මේ මොහොත තුලදී සකස් කරමින් ඉන්නවා එහි අරමුණ තමයි මුලින්ම කොළඹ දිස්ත්‍රික්කෙන් පටන් අරගෙන ඊට පස්සේ මුළු ලංකාව පුරාම දීප ව්‍යාප්තව සියලුම ගෘහයන් ඇතුලේ ඉන්න කාන්තාවන්ට දවසේ තමන්ට ඉඩපාඩුව තියෙන පැය කීපයක් පමණ වෙන් කරලා මේ සුළු කර්මාන්තය එහෙම නැත්නම් ස්වයන් රැකියා ව්‍යාපෘතියේ නිරත වෙන්න ඉතින් ඒ හරහා අපි විශාල ආර්ථික වෙනසක් මේ රටේ ඇති කරන්නට සැලසුම් කරනවා. ඒක ඇත්තටම යම් හේකින් මෙවර මහ මැතිවරණයෙන් සමගි ජන බලවේගය කියන්නේ ආණ්ඩු පක්ෂයේ හැටියට පත් නොවුණත් මේ වැඩපිළිවෙල අපි ක්‍රියාත්මක කරනවා කියන දැඩි ස්ථාවරය තුළ ඉන්නවා. මොකද මූලිකවම අපිට අවශ්‍ය වෙන්නේ දැන් මම හිතන්නේ ඔබ සියලු දිනට මතක ඇති 1978 හුඟක් මේ රටේ තිබිච්ච මේ ආර් මේ රැකියා විරැකියාව කියන ප්‍රශ්නයත් එක්ක විශේෂයෙන්ම කාන්තා පාර්ශ්වය තුල තිබිච්ච මේ ගැටලුව හින්දා මේ දිවංගත ආර් ප්‍රේමදාස මැතිතුමන් මේ නිදහස් වෙළඳ කලාප සංකල්පය ගෙනල්ලා නිවෙස් ඇතුලේ හිටපු තරුණියන්ට මේ අවස්ථාව ලබා දුන්න. නමුත් එතනිනුත් එහාට ගිහිල්ලා අපි පෞලක් පෝෂණය කරලා ඒ පෞල තුලින් ගම හදලා ගම තුලින් රට හදනවා කියන සංකල්පයේ මෙතනින් ඉදිරියට ගිහිල්ලා ඒ විශාල ආර්ථික වැඩ සැලස්ම ඉදිරියට අරගෙන යන්නට මේ මොහොතේ ක්‍රියාකාරී වෙලා ඉන්නවා. ඉතින් මම හිතනවා මේ සභාව තුල වුණත් එවැනි අපේ ව්‍යාපාරික මහතුන් ඉන්නවා නම් මෙවැනි දෙයක් සඳහා අපිත් එක්ක අත්වැල් බැඳ ගන්න පුළුවන්. මොකද ඒකේ පරමාර්ථය තමයි මේ රටේ ඉදිරිය ඇති වෙන විශාල ආර්ථික කඩා වැටීමත් එක්ක අපි යම් කිසි තැනකින් අපේ මේ ගමන ආරම්භ කළ යුතුයි. ඒ සඳහා අපි පදනමක් දැමීම තමයි මෙහි මූලික අරමුණ. ඒ වගේම කලින් කිව්ව වගේ අපි ඉදිරියේදී ජනගත කිරීමට නියමිත කාන්තා ප්‍රඥාප්තිය තුල විවිධ අංශ විශේෂයෙහි කාන්තාවන්ට රටේ සහන සහ විවිධ ආරක්ෂණ වැඩපිළිවෙල සකස් කළා තියෙනවා. එතකොට ඒ තුලිනුත් බලාපොරොත්තු වෙන්නේ කාන්තාව ඊටම ශක්ති සම්පන්න පුරවැසියෙක් හැටියට මේ රට ශ්‍රම හමුදාවට ඇගේ දායකත්වය ලබා ගන්න. ඉතින් මං හිතනවා මේ කටයුත්ත පළගැන්වුණොත් මේ රටේ වෙනත්ම ආර්ථික විප්ලවයක් ගොඩනගන්නට 
අපේ මේ දේශපාලන දැක්වට පුළුවන්කමක් ලැබෙයි කියලා. ඉතින් ඒ තුල මං හිතනවා මේ රටේ පැහැදිලි වෙනසක් ඇති කරන්නට ගෙදර නිවෙස් තුලින් පටන් අරගෙන මහා පරිමාණයේ ආර්ථික පෙරලියක් ඇති කරන්නට මේක යම්කිසි පසුබිමක් සකසාවි කියලා. ඉතින් මේ කාරණේ මම බොහොම සතුටින් සහ සුබවාදීව ඔබ සියලු දිනාටම කියන්නට නියමිතව තිබුණා. මොකද මගෙන් ඒ ඉල්ලීම කරා අපේ නායකතුමා සහ ජල්නි ප්‍රේමදාස මැතිනිය. ඉතින් ඒ කාර්යභාරය තමයි මං ඔබ ඉදිරියේ මේ හෙලිදරව් කරේ. ඉතින් ඒ හින්දා මේ ඉන්න පිරිස් අතරේ එහෙම ව්‍යාපාරිකයින් නොසිටි නොසිටියා වුණත් අපිට ඔබ සියලු දෙනාගෙන් මේ කාර්යභාරය සඳහා අත දෙන්නට මේ පණිවිඩය අනෙකුත් අය වෙත රැගෙන යන්න කියන ඉල්ලීමක් කරමින් මම මගේ වචන ස්වල්පය අවසන් කරනවා. බොහොම ස්තුතියි. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Keerthi Nanda. I think she uh, very correctly detailed out a comprehensive plan for women and their involvement in the next stage of uh, contribution to productivity in the country and also their involvement with the country's affairs under a SJB government. So next I call upon Dr. Dayan Jayathilaka to touch upon the post-COVID challenges as well as uh, briefly uh, highlight the foreign policy in terms of a future SJB government. Dr. Jain, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is this okay? Um, yeah. We are speaking in uh, twin contexts. One is the uh, imminent general election, and the other uh, is the larger global context. Uh, the global context is framed by two phenomena. One, obviously the uh, looming economic crisis driven not only by COVID-19, but also by a crisis of economic paradigms. I'll get to that in a moment. And the second big ticket item globally is the coming U.S. presidential election in November. But let's talk about the local before we get back to the global. This election is like no other because what is at stake is a future that is very different from anything that we have been through in our lifetimes. And I don't mean that in a positive sense. The ruling party is driving for a two-thirds majority in parliament. Uh, that is the key slogan. It won't help anybody, including the SJB, to avoid that issue, because that is the main issue of this election. Whether or not the ruling party succeeds in its objective of securing a two-thirds majority for the purposes that they have explicitly stated. Uh, the general purpose is the re-centralization of power in the hands of the presidency, leading to what I would call hyper-presidentialism, and more specifically, the abolition or the disemboweling of the 19th and the 13th Amendments. This has been made very clear uh, most recently, last evening, if you watch the television news, uh, the Honorable Prime Minister speaking at uh, a meeting organized, an event organized especially for him by Yutu Kama, which is a kind of a far-right ultra-nationalist caucus within the ruling bloc. Uh, and uh, in his speech, he said that uh, bowing to, as it were, the, the platform of youth coming, he said, if we are to change the transformations that have been put in place by the 19th and 13th Amendment, we need the people's vote, and we are sure that we will get that vote. So, what's the game plan, and what would be the implications of that game plan succeeding? The game plan is one of hyper-centralization of power of the concentration and indeed the monopoly of power. Because what happens 
if you uh, remove or dismantle the 19th and the 13th amendments. On the surface of it, these are two different things, but really they are not. The 19th amendment and the 13th amendment uh, impose certain checks and balances in the case of the 19th amendment. And in the case of the 13th amendment, there is a devolution of power. So it's all to do with power. And if you gut the 19th and the 13th, what you have is untrammeled executive power and authority. That's the first danger. But there is another danger, which is manifest. It's not hidden. But nobody's talking about it. What do we have now? What we have now is something that we have never had before, which is why I caution you against thinking that we are just going back to the bad old days of mine, the Rajapaksa and, you know, the SLFP and so on. We are not. It's much worse than that. You have a change in the structure of governance already. And that change in the structure of governance will be turned into a system. Now, what is that change? You have a government of, you have rule by the president and a number of task forces which do not even include the prime minister and the cabinet. Now that's very new. It's a new structure of power, of rule. And even after the election, that structure will remain and if the ruling party secures the two-thirds, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet will find themselves even more disempowered than they are now. Because the whole point is supposed to be to abolish the 19th Amendment, which means abolishing the, the powers that the Prime Minister and the Parliament have under the 19th Amendment and re-centralizing it in the hands of the Presidency, which will then proceed to rule through these unelected these bodies of unelected personalities. Now, I have the greatest respect for the Sri Lankan military, but what is happening is the imposition of a structure that cannot help the progress of the country, that cannot permit uh, the, uh, a role for the professionals or even the business community. Not because they don't want to, but the very logic of it, of this structure, goes against uh, the unleashing of the capacities of the professionals and generally the educated people. Why? Why did we win the war? Because our military had at that time sufficient experience, sufficient training, sufficient education in the art of war, and sufficient, as I said, practical experience in combat. The Tigers had lost a large number of their cadre, but the Sri Lankan military by that time was at a peak of experience and expertise. That's why we won. Now, that's true of every sphere of life. You get good at something because you have been taught that, and then you practiced it. You cannot appoint ex-military people to every conceivable sector, from archaeology to agriculture to, of all things, virtue. I love the virtue task force, you know. Um, and, and expect things to function as best as they can, because they may be very brilliant, and some of them have been very brilliant, in what they were trained and educated and experienced in doing. But now they're learning on the job. All of these fields are fields in which people have had to study, their degrees are relevant to the field, then there are examinations within those fields, and then they move up through their educational 
attainments and their experience. All of that is being abolished. How can a country progress with that structure? I'm not even getting into the issue of democracy and freedom and so on. It's a contradiction in terms. And that is what is at stake. Now, we've had governments with two-thirds majorities twice before. Once under the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, the second time under the UNP. Both times we had bloodbaths. Bloodbaths. Why? A two-thirds majority means you think you can do whatever you want. You think the people have given you that mandate, you don't have to listen to anybody. So, you do not seek out or even permit feedback. And that's like, a, that's like an economy functioning without uh, market signals. You just do whatever you want. You live in an echo chamber. That's why we had 1971. And it was under Madame Baranayake that the Tamil moderates embraced separatism by 1976. And under President Jawadana, I mean, the two-thirds, the five-sixths majority made the governing party at the time think that we could do without an election. So you had the referendum. And then six months after the referendum, you had July 83, because the pressure had built up. And there was no other way for it to go. It took the form of racism. So that's our experience. And there's this saying that's attributed to Einstein. He probably did say it, that uh, the definition of insanity is doing something over and over again and expecting a different result. So if these guys get a two-thirds majority, that's the worst possible thing that can happen to the country and to them as well. Just imagine it, a two-thirds majority in the hands of a, uh, an establishment that is already top-heavy. It's top-heavy, A, because you have ex-military people being appointed by the president to run everything, B, because you have an unprecedented number of family members, people belonging to one family, in the establishment. That's an oligarchy. And every member of a family, it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be the Rajapaksa family that happened during the Banaranakas. Uh, anybody who remembers the election campaign of 1977 will remember that uh, Paul Gasser, the family tree cartoon book. So it, it tends to happen. You've got the ex-military on top in the penthouse, and then the next floor, you will have all the family members, and then their entourages, and their hangers-on, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And the system will be carved out, one large chunk for the ex-military, and the rest of it for each one of these uh, members of the family in power. So tell me, where's the space for anybody else? You'll be suffocated. You'll be crowded out. And that goes for business. The moment you start redeploying the military in economic affairs, say like corporate farming. How is the private sector going to compete in terms of uh, labor costs? The private sector will be crowded out as well. So that's where we are headed unless the SJB, and it is the, only the SJB that can do that, I mean, let's be realistic. I'm not going to flatter you. Target number one, stop for two-thirds. Get out the vote. Make sure people vote. Because if it's a low poll in any country, it doesn't have to be rigged. The establishment wins. You have to stop the two-thirds. Don't, you know, have these dreams. First you stop the two-thirds. The people will be grateful. Because if you don't, everybody is going to blame the opposition. And say, so you guys were so weak that these guys wound up with a two-thirds majority. That should be the target. But aim high, because as in life, as in an examination, 
If you aim for the highest, you aim for a first class, you might get a second upper. But if you aim only for a second upper, you're going to wind up with a second lower and so on and so on and so forth. So aim high, that's fine. Go for the top. But know that you have to block this. Because if you do, then this is a one-term wonder, these guys. I mean, it's so top-heavy. The, uh, the economic model is crazy. And they're going to be nasty. They're already nasty. And the next time around, when the cycle turns, it's going to be you. But if they get a two-thirds majority, they're going to rewrite the rules. And when they rewrite the rules, you may not have a 2024 or 2025. Let's, let's be very honest. Sirima Ubanaraka tried it. It didn't work. Jai Javadana was toying with it, but thanks to our Prime Dasa, it didn't work. Because otherwise, you know, there would have been another, there would have been an extension and a fiddling with the rules. So these guys will try to do what other people wanted to, but never did. Because they couldn't. And if the rules are rewritten, then it will be very difficult. Very difficult to make a comeback. The whole playing field will be changed. So you have to go flat out. There is no next time unless you make sure there can be a next time. It's this time. This time. You have to grasp what Dr. Martin Luther King used to call the fierce urgency of now. Barack Obama used the same phrase. He took it from Dr. King. The fierce urgency of now. This time, this month. You got less than a month. Now, the second part of what I want to say is, okay, that's the challenge. What's our answer? Uh, the young speakers before me came out with some answers. I, I want to... I want to come at it somewhat differently. Look at it both globally and locally. It's the same picture. Globally, neoliberal globalism has failed, which is why you have this government in power here, Donald Trump over there, Bolsonaro, you know, different manifestations of nationalist populism. So that model is in crisis. What's the answer? Trump has tried to pioneer a very nationalist answer to globalization. And that's not working out either. I mean, look at the mess inside the United States and the relationships of the United States with every other country. So you have a crisis of neoliberal globalization and you have a crisis of the ultranationalist response to neoliberal globalization, the backlash. What you need is something else. Something that can tap into the strengths of globalization, which is now in crisis also because of COVID, the supply chains, but use the opportunity to put in place another model of globalization, not an alternative to globalization, but an alternative model of globalization, which is more humane, which is more equitable. And there are ideas about that. And our young politicians must study those ideas. Some of those ideas are coming from women, from women politicians. One of the most exciting things that's happening now is what's known as the Green New Deal. And the person who put that forward is the youngest ever Congress per person to be elected to the Congress in the history of the United States of America, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC. Joe Biden, who is way ahead of, the, of Trump in the polls and is tipped to, be the pres to win the presidency in November, has appointed this very young person, AOC, and a much more mature person, John Kerry, to co-chair the task force. He has also appointed task forces, but these are not uh, mili all ex-military people. Uh, the the co-chair of the climate change task force, the co-chairs are Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and John Kerry. 
So there are ideas which are based on Roosevelt's New Deal. That's why they call it the Green New Deal. And that's what Biden and the others are saying now, which is you have to learn from the lessons of the Great Depression and how Roosevelt got out of it. And that was by pumping up aggregate demand, which I believe is what Sajit is trying to say. Through intervention. Now this government hasn't a clue. You have three things going on, which will sort of when you put the three, the, the, the government's three economic ideas together, it looks rather like the coronavirus. I mean, it's that bad. One is a return to import substitution industrialization, the closed economy. Those of you who remember the closed economy know that it was a colossal failure, and that's why the UNP got a two-thirds, a five-sixths, because people in some parts of the country were dying. You know, in the streets of Kandy, there were people who were dying. In certain parts of the country, there were people who were eating papaw skins. Now, this government doesn't have the foggiest notion. And, and they don't value people, even in their camp, who know economics, like Professor W.D. Lakshman, who has always been on the center left. And he's the senior most economist in the country. His textbook in Singular uh, was has been the standard work for generations. I mean, he was my economics teacher at Peradeni. He's always been on that side of it. But you know what happened to him? Or the way he was treated? Uh, you know what happened to Dush, Dr. Dushni Virakon, who, who pretty much had to leave the monetary board. I mean, she got a PhD at 27 from the University of Manchester. So, they're not going to listen to people who really know the subject. One part of their economic model is this return to a closed economy. The other part, as uh, the first speaker was saying, is to open up even our forest areas to be ripped off by crony capitalism and multinationals. And then there's, when, when you, when this unrolls, you will see that uh, there are interlocking directorates and the uh, people who actually buy up stuff are all connected. So that's the economic model. What, what we need to do is what they're doing in the US now, the, the Democrats, thinking through a new model based on the experience of the Rooseveltian New Deal. But what may be surprising to you is that this happened in Sri Lanka before and we got out of it with new thinking. And the person who did that thinking was Ranasinghe Premadasa. I won't say President Premadasa because he was doing it long before he became president. Uh, in 1973, April, I believe it was April 4th, 1973, he addressed the Rotary Club of Colombo West. At that time, he had founded the Puravasi Parabuna. I, I see it as a kind of a pioneer of the SJB. Because he had tried to reform the UNP from 1970. He had seen the UNP lose twice, 1956 and 1970. Both times, the UNP ran on its record of the economy. And if you look at the figures in 1956, Mangala Samaravira had recently said, uh, uh, Sir John Kotalavla's time was a wonderful time economically, our economy was very robust. That's fine. But there was a, a landslide against the UNP. And then again in 1970, where the UNP was going on the basis of the Green Revolution, and it lost, especially in those areas where the Green Revolution took place, in the NCP. The only person in the 65-70 government, who warned the government at that time, he said, yeah, the Minimoks are outside St. Bridget's, if you want to know how the Green Revolution is going. And that was our Premadas. So in 1970, he presented his views in writing to former Prime Minister Dudley Sananayaka. From 70 to 73, nobody listened. He went out, he didn't leave the party, but he formed the 
Purvasa Paramuna, and he was invited by the Rotary Club of Colombo West. And I don't think Sajit has yet been invited, so Rotary Clubs have changed in the way they do things. He was invited to speak on the economy. And he pres what the speech he made was later published in the Observer or the Daily News. Uh, I know that because my father was the editor of the paper. Uh, so the whole speech was there. And Mr. Premadasa said, look, we have to learn from the fact that the UNP's economic model was rejected. But there's also an economic model which the Sirima of Manoraga government has put in place, which is going to cause a lot of hardship to people and is already causing hardship. So we need a different economic philosophy. And he rolled it out. Now, when I was working with President Premadasa, that's the time that we took over the Sark Challenge. And he, uh, he there was this idea that a couple of us, Susil Srivadhan and me, we came out with which he liked. And this was the independent commission on poverty alleviation, the Sark Poverty Alleviation Commission. When he took over Sark Chaperson, he's one of the few leaders in the world who could do what he, what he did. I'll, I'll tell you what he did. He presented his views as the new Sark Chair. And the Daily News in 1991 reproduced his speech of 1973 and in a box it said, look, I said this in 1973 and I'm saying it again now because that is what he practiced. When he won the presidency, the UNP was reeling, reeling in the sense people were being killed. UNPs couldn't even be buried with all the rites and rituals. So something was wrong with that model. And Prime Minister Premadasa had kept pointing out that there was something wrong. Using the reports as Sajid is using now, the UN reports. And then as Prime Minister, he pushed through the Varanasena Rasaputram Commission. And he had this alternative economic paradigm ready when he came in. So he did something that people thought, even economists thought, could not be done. That is, to revive the economy, so you had a higher growth rate, you had the stock market ticking over, you had an increase in foreign direct investment, at the same time you had a reduction in inequality. You had a real transfer of income to uh, the poorest of the poor. You had uh, Jana Savia, of course his old housing programs, uh, free midday meals, free school uniforms, all those programs with two civil wars going on. Now you can't do that unless your model is really a very strong, conceptually and practically strong model. And that is what Premadasa managed to do. I'm not saying we have to go back on a time machine, but we have to go back and trace the links. And that's what we and you as SJB stand for. It's not the old UNP's model. Because there has to be a reason that in 2001 when the UNP won the parliamentary election, it lost power and never got re-elected in 2004 and it lost again this time. That's because there's something wrong with the model. So you can't go back to a model that has failed. And never been, you know, since Premadasa, there's not been a president, a UNP president. There's a reason for that. He's the last. So if you want, you, you need to go back to where you got it right. And start from where it started going wrong. It started going wrong when his programs and his economic philosophy were abandoned by his own successors. And then you can present... You can intervene in the great crisis that is coming. But you have to defend democracy, stop a two-thirds majority, otherwise you won't have the space to intervene. But if you do that, then you have the new paradigm, which has been tested and proven successful. And an updated model, an upgraded model, can see you through not only to power in a short time but to a, a new Sri Lanka and the kind of Sri Lanka that 
would have existed had Premadasa not been assassinated in May 1993. I think that's, that's the challenge and that's the answer that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Diane, for touching on a few important topics. Uh, one is the uh, importance of uh, not allowing the incumbent government or the party in power to get a two-third majority, and also to prevent the return to a closed economy, also uh, the prevention of chronic capitalism, as it was put, and also the advent of militarization in the way that has been currently inculcated into the system. And also the key point that was highlighted is the point of thinking differently and coming up with a new model which the former president, Premadasa, correctly practiced and created the change that drove the country towards a new era or a new wave of development despite the presence of a civil war in the country as well. So next I invite Mr. Imtiaz Bakir Makar more or less to touch on the vision of the SCAB and give his thoughts on that. Mr. Imtiaz. Mulasini Sitna Tamna Sabhapai Tumani, my Mitra Dan Jayatilaka Mai Tumani, Inoka Satyanga Nimetiniani, we are going to pass in that pass. They are repeating our parliament to Mantri Kiramatan now start a very successful and rather Mantri to me Pudgaliko Dinaganda de Anne, Golanda Ultia Tino, Darupa Lino, Dadawaki Satia, the Osaka, Vado Kuma Yurakala, made the Osa Capaca Latino, Etienne Rata Piliban, the Hangi Makola and the Tina in the Kakumakin in the Sajit Pemada Sametumat, made Samoy Janaba given you a Pestutia, Age Kirima, Mampalamus and Ankara and Kamati, who will make the Capa Kirim, make a me chanted with the Tiagan Lipa. Digamatiagan, it will appear at a deshapalne killing karan, appear at a deshapalne king killing karan, Utika Tabuna Sagi, Diakatu, Itam, Vedegas. But Saji Pemadasan, a Vatina Kama, Tirumarantino. Then at a mat, a cake of Vishan built a Karaka Sabapat, Kuna, Kuna Karaka Piram, it will make Nayakati Baragan, Sudan, and Venekotama, Vishia come to Patkala. A Vishian Pitma, Denumati, Napi, Deshapalna King, Evata Patkala. The world is very important. Doctor Mahim Mendes Vietma <laughs> Wajahnya itu rai biasa mereka kira kewe, namun bahawa itu itu ni itu ada sampunem ahasa itu lawai wajib binasak. Mee video itu mee rata yang mana dengen itu, apat itu kamak mee, apat wajib mak tino mee rata ini. Mee mee rata api paksiya kiri itu api duk kino. Api juga kali dina eksa jadi ke paksi kyo, bahagi kali sedu beja. Anduru kali ya api katagalat ini. Mama prosid darasi mulai tu ikni tera matak kerono. Apat wajib dina mak tino. Iksa jadi ke paksi naya kyo. Aur itu pahagat bawa hamil lah makin ada api pahugi dah pasti game. Aur itu pahagat wala raja naya kami ini dalan eh. Apa itu purdu eh? Apa paksi naya kint? Hanya dah am aur itu pahagat seraya kapi kita raja naya kami wali eno. Hatta hati vitra ini dayan aur itu hatta kapi piti pas seri lah hiti. Ini jadi seni naya kami hatnya aur itu tu nai jaya jaya dalam hatnya aur itu hatta rai. Apa itu ayi mehima uni? Apa aksi bihari? Kalpa nak kalau balan eno. Apa itu mau hamil lah makin eno? Apa paksi peti pati? Mama dah kini. Sangsipnya, sakit lah kereta gatot, lipgal tu nak kuda tienni. 
ඉකත්තමයි ප්‍රජාතන්ත්‍රවාදය දෙක සමාජ සාධාරණත්වය තුන ජාතික එකමුතුව මේක තමයි අපේ පක්ෂ නිර්මාතෘවරු මේ පක්ෂයේ ගොළු නැගුවේ සමගි ජන බලවේගය ගියත් මම විශ්වාස කරනවා ඒ පදනම තුල තමයි ඉස්සරහට යන්න යන්නේ හැබැයි ලෝකේ වෙනස් වෙලා අද ලෝක දේශපාලනයේ වෙනස් වෙලා අලුත් පරම්පරාව හිතන විදිය ඔක්කොම වෙනස් වෙලා ඒ වෙනස් වීම් වලට එකඟව එකතන පල්වෙන්නේ නැතුව අපි වෙනස් වෙවි ඉදිරියට යන්නට ඕනේ පහුගිය කාලේ ඒ වෙනස් වීම් සිදු වුණේ නැහැ अपे प्रजातंत्रवादे रटे प्रजा रटे प्रजातंत्रवादी पवत्मी स्थावर भाव्य वेन्वी अभी पेनी हिटिया निर्भीत पेनी हिटिया अभियोगात्मक अवस्था अभी अपे पक्ष इवागेम पक्षे अतुर प्रजातंत्रवादे अतिगुना मोहद उदाहरण मम मम मंत्री वेन कुट मे कौम देख उने रंजन विजयरत्न महात्म महालेखम वर ये तो मत पुलवाम मुना कृतियाधिकारी मान लेते ये तो गण मीट पश्चे सांविधायक दुर्बल पुरापा व्यतिवन एव पक् सांविधान छांदीन तम तोर संविधान किरियल इंबुला महात्मे जाति पुत्र चूलनी किरियल चांदे चूलनी पराधाय सामान्य मीन सामान्य पौल फारूक महात्म्य पालमीन तो संगीधान नोड़ी बेरो चंदे अति वासनावट ये पौल संबंध का मठ अनु आप अनुद आठ नाम रहा चंदे मठ पाविशिकला पालमीन तो मेक तम स्वाभाविक नायक इंट मत दौरवा विवृत्त कर लंका सीर देश पालन सां पक्ष संसाधन अपट तिबुण समहार देश पालन पक्ष मनापोल दीर्ण उदवीय पालमीन तो ये अदृश्यमान हस्तिया के पालने करण तम डोने के नाम पाल मीन तो हेम बे अरे रूकड़ त्याग बे अदृश्यमान हस्त बे फेवर इंड पुल अंक मकने स्वाभाविक नायक इंट मतु इंट दिन नोनी मम इस्ला आधान के मम्मी पक्ष पड़ी एम पड़ी मम मम्मी मंगन की नोनी मैं दिनगा मम अपे पक्ष शिष्य पेर मुने जाति के सभापति उन्ना सिंगल लमित मैं वैडी हिटी माँ तोरगा अंतर विश्वविद्यालय शिष्य बल मन सभापति कमट माव तोरगा तरुण पेर मुने लेखम कमट माव तोरगा निकंदुना කෙලින් නැති බැරි මිනිස්සු එතුමස් දේශපාලන ශබ්ද කෝෂයේ ඇතුල් කරපු වචන දෙයක් ඒක නැති බැරි මිනිස්සු ඇති හැකි මිනිස්සු බවට පත් කිරීම ඒ මේ නිදහස් සද්ධ්‍යාපනේ නිදහස් සෞඛ්‍ය දැන් අපි විශ්වවිද්‍යාලයේ ඉන්න කාලේ අපි දරුවන්ට තිබුණ ණය ක්‍රමය ඒක අපි උපාධිය පිට කළ එලියට ආවට පස්සේ රස්සාවක් ගෙවලා ණය ගවන්න ඕනේ අපේ පක්ෂේ නායකයෝ තමයි ඒක නැති කරලා මහ පොළ ආධාර දුන්නේ පොට් ටික දුන්නේ ඇඳුම් ටික දුන්නේ නිල ඇඳුම දුන්නේ නොමිලේ ඉඩම් දුන්නේ ජනපද ව්‍යාපාර ඇති කෙරුවේ මේ මට මෙහෙම පෙළගා මේ අපට සමාජ ප්‍රජාතන්ත්‍රවාදී න්‍යාය පත්‍රයක් තිබුණා අපි පුද්ගල අයිතිය පිළිගන්නවා තරඟකාරී සමාජයක් පිළිගන්නවා තරඟේදී දක්ෂය ඉදිරියට යනකොට පසුබාන කොටස් ආදායෙන් රැක බලා ගන්න වැඩ පිළිවෙලක් අපේ පක්ෂයේ හැම වෙලාවම ආරක්ෂා කළා නමුත් පහුගිය කාලේදී අවුරුදු 31ක් අපට රාජ්‍ය නායකකමට යන්න බැරි වුණා හේතුව උරුම ගමනින් අපි පිට පැන්නා प्रजातंत्रवाद अभ्यंतर प्रजातंत्रवादी नेतु न ये उर्म अंत दक्षिणांशिक पक्ष वर्ट जातियांतर अंतर जातियांतर अंतर जातियांतर अंत दक्षिणांशिक पक्ष संधान अंत अपे पक्ष गेट गया हुआ ये न्याय पत्र वर्ट गया बटेर रटवाल वर्ट मांग किया हिम्बरी साहब है दिनों अपे हाथ तीन उन्नसान निपाते है दिनों विदेश प्रतिपत्ति आधीन विदेश प्रतिपत्ति अति बुण है अपट आधीन विदेश प्रतिपत्ति तीर्णात्मक अवस्था अपे नायक पेन्नु अभी आधीन विदेश प्रतिपत्ति अपट ती बुण किए वे जपाने वेटीच विलावे अनेक रटवाल जपाने वंदी लन विलावे जया जवाद महात्मा गिल क्यूवा वेटीच रटक वंदी गाने मे एक अंत खेलिंग हिट अभी उदव कर अंटो ने किया नही वेर गाता वकी मतला सेंट फ्रांसिस्को वाली मुड़ अधिराज्यवादी रटवा चीने हुदे कला कम्युनिस्ट रटवा हुदे कला करोनी संबंध का त्याग पैकिन विला अभी सहल रबर ग्यूस मील असंकल चीने अत्य अब प्रतिपाति अति बुण मट रणिल विक्रम सिंह महात्मा के प्रस्तुति अभी दाकून अफ्रिका निधास उदाऊ कला इवागे मत मैं अभी नायक प्रेमदास महात्म्य एक्सा जाति संविधान तीर्ण वल्ट हिस नमनता कल अभी इसराल अत संबंध कम पवता नहीं है किल मम इस जा पलस्तीन निधास विनिमय पाल मीन कथाकरण अनकोट मट कथाकरण पाकि 
उगते लंका भी देश पाल लेके ना बुर्ती क्यों काले किरी ला इगे ने कहा तो अलूट परंपरा वाला काले किरी ला समाहरु दुबई के चंदपुर टे अंडर लैस्ट ही ने वैरा ने रेवटी ला तीन ने वंचा वाती तीन ने अवस्था वादी तीन ने रंगपैय मार्क तीन ने किला कल्पना करनुआ अद अलूट बलापुरु त्वक देनुआ एक और लेकिन निकालते के द मायती पास सिर से तो महात्मा राजलिंग क्रोसिंग के महात्मा मैं केली मैंगल दिख करूँ ना ये ये गेटूम प्रश्न आरुप भी वहीं तो थमाए अपने अपे बलापुरुष तो युटुब करान होगा बैरी होने द एक के ने रिजो में इन्नो आंडू तेक का अन्य तेक ना वाक्रो इन्नो आंडू तेक तेक अनागतवादी पक्ष या साजिद बांड साका चावल टक गया बुद्धि मुतुन ने करने साका चावल दी माध्यम ते करने साका चावल दी सा मामा क्या नहीं मैं साजिद तो मैं सर्व हरी मैं वैल्यू दिन नहीं थी आडू पारू नहीं थी क्या लोगों पिंटू रैक मामा ने मामा हादरवा नहीं मैं ना मुझे सांसद नहीं कहला बांड मैं माध्य प्रश्न उत्तर साक्षात चावल टा आशा विन साहब आगे बिनो इवस से लाइन नो आये प्रश्न वाले टू उत्तर देन ने किया ला घोटा बेरा जब पक्ष महात्मे ला इन्हीं ने साक्षात चावल वाले टे माइंड तो आगे में तो आप इश्क किया साक्षात चावल टीनी ने अदब हम आप योग्य कल तेरे बारे का निकालने दिन ने विला माम आलंका व गिनिया नो उन्हें कोतर दिखे ने क्या कहने विश्वास या तीनों आओ बोध या तीनों अनागतवादी देख मक तीनों इंसा या बायन तो मार दिए मुहून मुहून देनों अरुपा दुकानती है दूर लखानती है जी लोग के मुहूर्त में उदाहरण ने माम एक माम वैदिक कताकारे में एक कारुना कितरा माम दाकिन दयात मैं आ वैदियम आवधार नहीं करना साजिद पे में दास दानात पक जाति का क्या गया ना पॉजिटिव नेशनलिज्म गया ना आवधार नहीं करना माँ मैं के धकिन ने अरे ओबामा वागे ओबामा माँ पिछले मौसम एक दिन नेशनल महारत काटती है इन तक इन दिन पुला नो इन दिन पुला इतुमाटे ओबामा टे बैरुना या के काले दे � अमेरिका वो लोग के तक का युद्ध कर कर हितियों अमेरिकन समाजे पोषण का मराएगा न पुलवां का मकने अमेरिका वे प्रतिरूप है नेतिव लायन वकीला या मुकाद कले अमेरिका वे पासमितुर राठवाल लोगों में एकतुक रगान उत्साह है अगाता पुलुल विश्व देख मक मामा दाकिन ओबामा तुल बलन जापान इट वड़ा बोम्ब अस ये यालो उना मित्र उना तातु पारस दाल अमेरिकन नायोजनों टा आराधना करने पटांग आता वियतनाम में उनका किट्टू उना इन दिन क्यूबा मामा तमाम यूएनपी तमाम समाज भी महानो मामा पाल भी इन्तेरो तो मामा क्यूबन मित्र संग में सभा बति पारसिन मित्र संग में सभा बति यूएनपी कार्य में वोट किया ला � ईरान है अविष्य माँ के लिए में गिरुस मर गया ईरान आप एक हिट्टू ना तो ये उसको में हिट्टू कर गाते रांडू वे भी हिट्टियों इधर ही गमन आ डाल देने वाला प्रश्न देने वाला तेरुंग ऐनी मक्ती बुना आप इतना सटा खेती है तो साजिद तेरुंग आरंती नो एक आये या पॉजिटिव जा नेशनल में नेशनलिज्म के नकाता कराने राते ऐतु ले प्रश्न आप ये आओ मकर गाते नेतनाम आप इतना कावड़ाक बात ओल्वो सन्नपुलुआ का मकने राते ऐतु ले प्रश्न आडू लीक वाला नहीं हो गया ना यार फिर नहीं आता राधा बाबा ने लोगों के प्रधानों एक अपुंगल आधा है मैं तीन उधर पर आठवाल दाहा एक गातो तेरे दाहा यात्रों तक सिंगापुर होती है ना ना मुझे पटांग गाते को हम बोले मम्मा कावड़ हर सीला कावक कराने दोने के ला अभी तो मुझे दोने में भी दिए थे अभी पनास साइन पस्से नायका रजात या कुना 
ඊට පස්සේ ආපු දසක පහම අපි ප්‍රචණ්ඩත්වයත් එක්ක හිටියේ එක්කෝ සිංහල දෙමළ ප්‍රශ්නයක් කිව්වා එහෙම නැත්නම් කැතලික් ඇක්ෂන් මට මතකයි මම හෝලි ක්‍රොස් කොලජ් එකට කලුතර ගියේ ඒතර මම කළු පටි දාගෙන ගියා ළමයි ඒ පැත්තේ ජෝසප් සෝයිස් කියලා ළමයක මරලා තිබුණා ඉඳගෙන ඒවලා ඒ කැතලික් කතෝලික ආක්‍රමණයක් ගැන කතා කළා බිල් එක මැව්වා පෞගේ කාලේදී ඉස්ලාම් බිල් එක ඔබ බැහුවා මේ විදිහට රන් යන්න පුළුවන් කමක් පන්ති වෛරය වෙපිරෙව්වා ආයෙ ගැචා කැලල්ලක් ආවා මේ මේ මෙහෙම යන්න පුළුවන් කමක් නැහැ මේ රටට. එහිඳ අපේ රටට බලාපොරොත්තුවක් දෙන වැඩ පිළිවෙලක් අපි සජිත් අනික අනික තමයි විශ්වසනීයත්වය. සජිත් කිව්වා අපේක්ෂකයෝ කොහොම කැඳවලා මොකද්ද කිව්වේ? මාත් එක්ක වැඩ කරනවා නම් වරදාන බලාපොරොත්තු වෙන්න එපා, වරප්‍රසාද බලාපොරොත්තු වෙන්න එපා. අපේ සමාජයේ ආර්ථික සමාජ වෙනසක් කරන්න අපිට ලොකු වාකීමක් තියෙනවා, ලොකු මෙහෙවරක් තියෙනවා. ඒක සඳහා කැපවීම ඔයගොල්ලන්ගේ මත අවශ්‍යයි. ලෑස්ති වෙන්නේ ඒකද කියලා කිව්වා. මේක තමයි නායකත්වය. ඒ නිසා ඒ සජිත් ප්‍රේමදාසයන් දිහා මේ ජන බල වේගයේ දිහා වපරහින් බලන්න එපා, පාඨක අන්නාඩි වලින් බලන්න එපා කියන ඉල්ලීම තමයි මට කරන්න තියෙන්නේ. මේ පණි අපිට මාධ්‍ය නෑද? ඇත්තටම ජයා ජවාදර මහත්තයාත් මාධ්‍ය තිබුණේ නැහැ. මතකනේ ලේක් කවුසි ආණ්ඩුවට අරන් තිබුණේ. ටයිම්ස් ආණ්ඩුවට අරන් තිබුණේ. අපි පත්තර වර්ජනය කළා ඒකට. ආණ්ඩුවේ හොරණ නැහැ වෙච්ච හින්දා. අපිට ගහප බඩ බඩක් වෙනවා බැටන් පොළු පහරවල් කාපු හැටි අපි දුවපු හැටි ඒ දවස්වල බැටන් පොළු පහරවල් කමින් එහෙම යුගයක් තිබුණා කට වචනේ තමයි ජය යාත්‍රා තිබුණ ඉඳගෙන ඒ කාලේ අපේ අපේ නායකයෝ අපේ ක්‍රියාකාරිකයෝ ගෙයින් ගෙට ගියා මහන්සි වුණා කට වචනේ පාවිච්චි කළා තව සති හතරයි අපිට තියෙන්නේ ඒ ඉඳලා මේ වෙලාවේදී මේ රටේ මේ මිනිස් ජනතාවගේ විශ්වාස භංගත්වයක් තියෙන දේශපාලනේ සැබෑ වෙනසක් ඇති කළා අලුත් ගමනක් අලුත් ශ්‍රී ලංකාවක් වෙන රටේ ඇති කරන්න අපි අපේ දායකත්වය කැපවීමෙන් දිය යුතුව තිබෙනවා අපි අපේ කට වචනය පාවිච්චි කළ යුතුව තිබෙනවා ඉතින් ඔයගොල්ලෝ වෘත්තිකයෝ ඔයගොල්ලන්ගේ මට්ටමෙන් ඒ කැපවීම කරන්න ඡන්දෙන් මේක ඡන්දට සීමා කරන්න එපා මේ සම්බන්ධිත මේ සංවිධානය මම ඉල්ලා හිටනවා අපේ දේශ දේශපාලනයත් එක්ක ඔයගොල්ලන්ගේ සම්බන්ධයේ ඉතාම වැදගත් ඔයගොල්ලන්ගේ දායකත්වය අපිට අවශ්‍යයි අපේ රටේ දේශපාලනයේ කෙලින් කරන්න දැනුවත් වූ දිවගේ දායකත්වය ඉතාම අවශ්‍යයි ඒක තියා ගන්න කියලා ඔයගොල්ලන්ගේ බැගෑ පත්‍ර ඉල්ලලා ඒ සමග ජන බලවේගී විශිෂ්ට ජයග්‍රහණික ගෙනෙන්න අපි හැමෝටම කියවක් ලැබියවක් කියලා ප්‍රාර්ථනා කරලා මේ කතාව මම අවසන් කර ගන්නවා. Thank you very much uh, Mr. Ekdias Baki Makar. I think uh, uh, Mr. Ekdias touched on key points of positive nationalism, uh, democracy that existed once in the United National Party, something he wants to transcend back to the Saudi Arabia Vega and also uh, one important point that was highlighted on creating uh, the party the SKB as a party where it welcomes professionals and their ideas so i am actually a very good testimonial i never done politics or been in a political stage and i went there two and a half weeks ago and i'm certainly a, it's a good testimonial to give for myself that this is a party which listens to professionals and it's a party that unlike the Vyatmaka campaign on something is something that we can actually professionals can contribute and the leaders are actually listening so uh, i cordially invite any other professionals to be a part of this group this is a nationwide group which will become a global movement and hope to contribute in a more active way so now we move on to the panel discussion which we will take seated so may i first ask the first question from dr daya Uh, so dr dayan i think one of the key questions or a perception that runs in society as a whole is that the sjb is a new political force and it lacks the maturity uh, as we may put it in uh, that sense to govern this country in terms of the leaders leaders and its qualification has been questioned and so on so in that respect um, how would you actually respond to uh, such a question on whether the SJB is ready to govern at this very juncture. Okay, I, I prefer to answer that because... Uh, okay. You know what? Uh, the uh, old line of uh, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill said, uh, Democracy is the worst system there is, except for all the others. That's pretty much my answer about the SJB. Because what do I see when I when I look at the range of choices? You have uh, the government of the day, and I, I and I think 
quite a few of you know that I supported uh, President Mahindra Rajapaksa for about 15 years. That's uh, from before he secured the nomination of uh, his party for the first time, from the time he was the leader of the opposition. Um, and uh, I was also uh, invited to speak on the occasion of the, the first convention of Vietnam, although I, never, I refused to join the organization, but I was a key speaker um, in 2017. And then again, Elia. Now, what has happened is that the ruling formation has been hijacked by the most right-wing, militaristic, authoritarian, and racist group of uh, people that we've ever seen in our political history since 1947. Now, this is not something that's specific to Sri Lanka because as part of the global crisis, you see the whole Trump phenomenon, but now it's on, on its way out and down and out. But it was something that the United States had not seen before. Because of disappointment with the liberal establishment and the need for change, people opted for Donald Trump saying, look, he's never been a politician, which is a good thing. And now there's a complete disaster within the United States and in the United States relationships with the outside world. So in the U.S., the cycle is on its, it's devolving, it's moving downward. In Sri Lanka, it seems to be moving up. But it will be even more disastrous. The United States can afford certain mistakes. We can't. This is the most extreme administration. Uh, dominated by those who have had no political experience, no experience in democratic politics. Uh, you have a situation in which uh, the Corona Task Force, for instance, does not even have their own prime minister on it. So it's a, a very dangerous far-right uh, potentially tyrannical regime. So that's what you have on this side. On the other side, what do you have? You have uh, the United National Party, which is the only party in the whole world that has been under the same leadership for 25 years. And this is at a time when the world is, uh, is changing at a faster rate than ever before. In a changing world, the only unchanging thing is the leadership of the United National Party. <laughs> and it's okay not to change if you're successful, but unchanging and unsuccessful, I mean, come on. Give me a break. <laughs> and then you have the JVP. I mean, I think the JVP takes uh, a good stand on uh, issues of racism and so on. But look, the, they did well when they were part of a, an interim administration under Chandrika. But then they were so unused to uh, doing something responsible and constructive. They did well. But they just moved out of that. So their 40 seats has dwindled now. Because they just don't have what it takes to run a country. Now, what does it leave? That leaves the SJB, and I trust it because I worked with President Premadasa. And if anybody has uh, something of, of the Premadasa philosophy, it surely has to be Sajid. He is today the closest that Sri Lanka has come in a very long time to a social democrat uh, and a non-racist mainstream politician who is also a liberal Buddhist, which is a good thing. Because Buddhism is a very universalist philosophy. May all living beings be happy. You can't get more universalist than that. So here yeah, you have a pluralist, you have a patriot, but a patriot who is not a narrow nationalist, who is not a tribalist. If this government goes away, it's going. And now it is pretty much promised to 
unilaterally dismantle most of the 13th Amendment, you're going to have a country that is dividing. I would like to, I wouldn't like to say that we'll be divided, but it's going to start cracking up because the different communities will be alienated from each other. The Tamils, because you're pulling back devolution. Mm -hmm. The Muslims, because there's blatant uh, Islamophobia uh, being stoked. By the way, I wonder what happened to Dr. Shafi. Um, what has happened to Dr. Shafi is that the guy who was in one of those instrumental in that campaign, uh, Dr. Chandra Jayasumana, is on the national list of the ruling party. So you have blatantly racist people. Now the Viet Maga and the Aliyah, I'm sorry to say, which is why I never joined those, though I was invited to participate and I did speak on the platform, because I will speak on any platform, is because they are racist. I mean, I, I, I know that from inside. And I'm not the only one who moved out. Uh, you'll be interested to know that the first person who moved out and came to my home and said, Dan, I'm, you know, I'm, I just can't stay there, and I was the second, was Rukman said and I. Because Rukman and I were both invited for the opening of the, of, for the Elia. And then he moved out first, and then I moved out because there was something, you know, you just it, it, extremist ideas. Which I have to say I never experienced when I was working with Mahindra Rajpaks. So these people are different. And it's not even Gotabe, I have to tell you that. Because if you talk to him one on one, uh, or even in a crowd, he, he can get what you're saying. And there are two sides to him. But it is this very thick layer. Now you have this advisory council. I mean, it's transparent. You know who's, who's what. The advisory council, there are the task forces, then you know who the key players are. And these are people, the same sort of people who, who in other countries like former Yugoslavia caused the destruction of former Yugoslavia. And that's, a, uh, that's where we're going. Sajid and the SJB, I think, are the last best chance to save this country. That's my answer. So uh, in the best interest of time, as what was informed to me, uh, I would take uh, any questions from the audience so you can uh, raise it uh, to any of the speakers. Yeah, about the two-thirds, I mean, this may sound like I'm joking, but I'm not. If perhaps the most respected and liked Sri Lankan internationally, Kumar Sangakara, could be questioned for nine to ten hours, nine to ten hours in a police facility, and Aravinda Diserva, who was said by wisdom to be the finest batsman at that time, could be questioned for six hours. What do you think, and that's without a two-thirds majority for this government, what do you think would happen if they did have a two-thirds majority? I'm not joking, that's a real danger. Who's safe? If they don't care how they look, and what people feel, because this is the most popular sport in the country, if they don't care now, what would they do if they had a two-thirds majority? Now, it's possible, it's quite possible, because we've all heard Vajra Vivodana saying that in his infinite wisdom, Mr. Ranil Vikram Singh put in the term Jatika Andua, into the constitutional amendment and therefore the UNP will be back in power because their services are going to be needed by the SLPP. He's, it's open, he said it openly and he was not the only one, he's not the only one who has struck that note. 
after the disastrous experience of the last coalition government. The UNP is openly saying that. And on the other side, Lakshman Yapa Vivadana said, we have given a green light, a Kola Elia, to the UNP to join us. So yes, this can happen, but it can only be prevented by the SJB. Because if you get a sufficiently large number and percentage of votes and seats, then you can put the two-thirds majority beyond reach. You have to kick it so far into enemy territory that there is no way that even the UNP can prop them up. Because if the UNP shrinks to this, then of what use, I mean, who can use it to get a two-thirds majority? So it's up to you or it's up to the SJB. That's crucial. Because you can save the country, democracy, the economy, everything. You can prevent this island from cracking up politically between the communities. If you are able to keep the rules of the game going, if you don't allow them to tie it up, but if the UNP has half a chance, they've openly said it. This is not uh, my imagination. They've said it, and the other guys have said, we, we have a green light. These guys have said, look, we are going in there. So I don't see why the SJB doesn't, I haven't heard it being said on the platforms. They should be pointing this out, that this is now open. So a vote for the UNP is really a vote for the status quo. So you might as well vote for the status quo if you want it. Why bother to vote for, you know, to try to catch your nose you know, around your head? So you're right. If, if you vote UNP, you're voting for two thirds. That me tunen deke prasne ne me other element of parliament mati varne pradhan prasne velati. Andu pakshe ki no apur tunen deka denna kumak sandhaad. Janadipati tumahage hasta haste shakti mat karan. Eki anne balaya sangke endar gata karan. Yalit vatav. Kelim me ki no dahana me ni sang sodhane dahatung me ni sang sodhane veras karan. Indi dahana me ni sang sodhane veras kar po ama dana ta tiye na kondha kering karan ni inna mati varna komisaris kene ki inna na oye mainda desha priva ke kene patwa inna na indi eka ne venne dahana me ni sang sodhane ibat kar po ama Katukah apa? Mana muka ada prajurit itu apa? Entah kotak. Eka adi pati nata agnya dah kat tu, kita tiennya yam yam sima bandana. Waktu malih ada dahana. Dah tu mungkin sang sod ni. Ibat kerot nata menas kerot. Apa hu? Aro utur dah kuno perasne? Ati beno. Dah tu mungkin sang sod ni. Yang Hindu langka agi bismat tak kapu deh ni. Entah kotak. Ila kita asal la sirat tak kat pat lain deh no. Ay, yudde kahale, yudde jaya grahane kerana parisare haduwe India ur porundu diila, dah tunggu ni sanksod ini sampur ni makriyat makarno aja. Ebi tera nemi samara asta waldi kiuwa dah tunggu dana kiel, samara asta waldi kiuwa dah tunggu mata godan ke building upon kiel. Ini eh mak kiel a porundu ella likita pratiknya diila, ini pas segi ni kot apitnya tunen dega dene nemi ka akulagan dega kiel a, itu kot a apda apa hu ekdas tu mesti asuga nanggal wa aje. विशाल प्रश्न या कहते हुए ने बोला हम आसार वैसी या समझ दें मैं तूने इन द कपिल में तो इतना मैं सारे लबत बालंड बोला हूँ मैं भी दी है तो लंका वे अभी लंके के पूर्व वैसी आते रहेंगे लोग के वड़ा आत्मा कीर्तिमत पुत्गले का उद लोग लोग प्रजा वे हाँ वड़ा आत्मा ये ला जाते अंतर नंबू � Kau dah ingat Kumar Sangakkar? Nang Kumar Sangakkar ada geniela, nanti indah geniela. Paya dahaya kita kitu. Prasna keranda puluan nang. Muka demi rata tatte. Nang itu ram janapriya budgele, janapriya krida, kelangka itu le. Me chanda kahalit tak? Jati antarwasa ingut pratijara tiu nang. Abidakka Ravi Shastri katakan nang iye. 
एहेम कर मेरा आंड दर्शक ඒකෙන් රට ලේ සාගරයක් බවට පත් වුණා දෙවතාවක් තුන්වෙනි වතාවෙත් එම වැඩේ කරන්න එපයි කියන එක සියලු දෙනාම ඉටා ගත යුතුයි Any more questions from the audience? Yes, to Dr. Man talking about the global context you mentioned the new globalization is it possible to maybe outline the new things Most certainly. Now the confusion here, and I have to confess, I made the same. I mean, a speech in Moscow. I'm not going to say the same thing. I'm not going to give a speech here. But the basic idea, which I spoke at the High School of Economics in in Moscow, was this: Let's not confuse neoliberalism and globalization. The problem has is that those two have been put together. Globalization is that you have an integrated global economy. Uh, you have uh, production lines that are global. You have a global market, and that brings all of us closer together. It has given a great number of people a better standard of life, whether it's the economic miracle of China or of India. Both those took place during the period of globalization. So this is a good thing, and uh, whether it's China or India or Russia or Vietnam, nobody wants to roll back globalization as such. Uh, the Vietnamese uh, Prime Minister, the Vietnamese Foreign Minister, addressing an ASEAN conference, a teleconference on COVID, because they've been extremely successful. Um, not a self proclaimed success but globally acknowledged success uh, they said we have to balance protection from covid-19 and restoring globalization so globalization is a good thing though in sri lanka the new regime seems to want to delink i mean they're proud of import controls and you have this topsy turvy world in which the president says now we have banned these imports now you better produce that's not the way you do it i mean if you actually ask professor lakshman i'm sure he would have told him that you you can you have to have the right ratio between stimulating local demand and the gradual reduction of imports but the policy now is no we we are delinking basically we are stopping the imports and then we expect you to produce to pick up the slack the problem was with neoliberalism now neoliberalism unfortunately is the policy that the united national party in sri lanka practiced under uh, its permanent leader <laughs> and i must say though i mean since i'm not a member of your party i can say this and mr mangala samaravira that is not the policy of the united national party even under president jaya jawadan which is why his grandson left the party and in the interview he gave he said my grandfather who opened up the sri lankan economy 
did not adopt this policy. The state had a very strong role. The Mahavali project was entirely a state project. And there was a strong social welfare programs. And that's not what is being done by the UNP today. Which is true. An open economy is not a neoliberal economy. A neoliberal economy is one in which you don't care about national assets. It's not the model that you have in the ASEAN countries or the Far East. But under neoliberalism, you don't care. You, you just sell off everything. I mean, look what happened to Hamantara. I mean, who gave that to the Chinese? Not the previous government. I mean, sorry, not the Rajapaksa government. It was the Vikramasin government. So, there's no notion of strategic national assets. There's complete faith in, in the... It, it's free market fundamentalism. There is no sense of social equity. And that is the neoliberal model which rode on top of the process of globalization which is a positive process. So what we have to do is not to step back from globalization which is what this regime is doing because it's an ultra-nationalist regime. And let me tell you a secret. Why do they want to do this? Because in their ideology there is a notion that the minorities the business in, in, in business are sort of connected globally because they have uh, ethnic connections across the borders and they find it easier to operate in a globalized economy but if you close it off then the state which the majority controls or at least some people control in the name of the majority can control the economy as well and then it's no longer a level playing field because a level playing field is something they don't like because on a level playing field somebody wins somebody loses you can't always win your guys can't always win so that's the logic that's the dirty little secret behind this economic philosophy so we need to be able to look at globalization again to restore globalization but post COVID globalization is not going to be the neoliberal version because the people of the world have seen what has happened in the United States, in Britain, even with NHS in Britain, because of the havoc wreaked on communities by neoliberalism. That's why they pulled out of Brexit. It may not have been the smartest thing to do, but there was a reason. Look at the United States. And that's why Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, they've all been talking about, and of course Barack Obama, Obamacare. It's the only, it's supposed to be the, the richest country in the world, the only place where you don't have free health care. So that's the neoliberal model. That's free market fundamentalism. And look what's happening there. Look what's happening in Brazil under Bolsonaro. It doesn't work. But going back to a self, so-called self-sufficient import substitution economy doesn't work either, but we are on that track now. What you need is a non-neoliberal globalization. And that is what we have to find in Sri Lanka and that is what the world is searching for as well. Uh, 
infrastructures or anything like uh, are we making the new anything like any apps stuff like that well, as for Sajid's vision for 2030, you wouldn't have to ask Sajid, but I think that uh, no, I, I think that he's he's got the basics right. Because like in the case of his father, he has said very clearly that he's not a neoliberal. That he's opposed to neoliberalism. But he's also the sharpest and best informed critic of this government's economic policy. So he's clearing the space. Uh, and I think in terms of a paradigm, he's got the fundamentals right. Now the specifics, I don't know, but I can tell you that if you don't get the fundamentals right, if you don't have your paradigm right, your economic paradigm right, then you can't get anything else right in the economy. That's why this government is going to fail economically. I mean, they just don't have it right. And Ranul Vikramasinghe and, and Mangala, they failed too. So you have to have a third paradigm and I do think that Sajit has inherited that and he is an updated version of that. Your question, <clears throat> look, the 2008 crisis, that's very important. The United States, it may have had a bull market, but you know there's a distinction between what's known as the real economy and the money economy. So what the financial markets show is one thing, but in terms of actual production, uh, there was a crisis. There was a crisis, uh, jobs were moving out of the United States, industrial output was dropping. Trump responded to that, but his response has worsened things. And you find globally that China has been, uh, I mean, I'm not anti-Chinese, but I'm saying that the American uh, bull market was an illusion because the Chinese were doing better globally and now the Americans are responding with trade sanctions simply because the Chinese were using globalization better than the United States because the US internal model wasn't good enough. Now in the Democratic Party they are rethinking and I do think that if there's a change of government the US will once again be able to lead uh, the world community because it will get the policies right and the, the, poli the right policies are not those of Trump and they're not those of uh, the sort of neoliberal fundamentally. So the US bull market was in a way illusory. It was, it was, it was a financial bubble but the, uh, in terms of the real economy that was a relative decline, relative decline in relation to especially China. So that's, that's what it is. As for us stepping in, unless you have the right economic model in Sri Lanka, one, two, unless you've got your ethnic equation between the constituent communities, the components that make up this island right, you cannot tap into anything. You can say you're going to tap into it, but that's the basis. And we have not got those two things right. We have not got the economic model right, because you swing from one extreme to the other. When you've got growth, you've got, you've got inequity. When you've got equity, you don't have growth. And we haven't got our ethnic an ethno-religious relationship, right, has got far worse than it ever was. So it, we are cracking up at the base. And you have an economic model that isn't the right one. So you really cannot get the best out of anybody, whether it's the Indians or the Chinese or the Americans or anyone. That's, that's the way I see it. Any further questions? Ah. 
Tapi pasti dia, tapi paling dia sakit dari kalau nak mereka berdiri, tapi dia itu pasti dia pun nak dia na. Adi itu naik juga nak kata kata ni bayar, kata macam kata kata ni kiri tau. Mungkin kalau dia tu perlu dibantu ni. Saji tu kan yang ni ada. Tapi ada lagi paling berpeh no. Ibu tangan tu tu ayo jenis hati no. Ujar balik hati no. Tapi aku panas super tu. Mungkin tu naik lagi upaya mak. Saja tu je. Eka itu kalau kita ini over naik lagi. Dewa. एक एक दर्पण दाह पांच सीज़न साली वेदन करना फुल टाइम उसे दाह दी ना ये कुछ साजिद के नाम ही ना करो बा याना मार दी क्या याना आर दी क्या रेस्पर ये बात नेचुरल ये बात नहीं कुछ भी मुझे तो हदर दी ना दी बात मेरे चैलेंज जाएगा कभी कभी बार गाने अब ये होगा अब बात पे इधर ऐसे बोले मार Kata awalnya one minute clip dega, one to three minute. Api mana? Eka, hamba nama mana? Hamba kata awal mana? Ubu tala mini video kamera orang pas kalau eka yang mana tu? Api ke orang awal dah mini suka orang kat tu dek mana? Mea kau tu mana? Keran ni mana tu kian ni? Dan, anda ni mana? Perbeza sama, perbeza sama tu ya. Agak betul yang nak kali. Kamu mungkin hilang ya, wih macam mana? Ini dah selam buat orang, emang memang betul. Ya tak kiri dia, Evans kure, Anthony Fernando, then ni full time. Before he was prime minister, he was minister of local government. Dah ina. Eka me, atari ni. Aku atari ni bukan dia macam ni. Emma madi kerja orang ingat. Kawiya pula nak kawiya kita. Jadi, kita, apa kerana orang nak bank, alut tewal ni rumah ni kan tak? Sajid ke kata apa ini? Kamu tu kata, ni mama, kamu kata ambil na Moscow ini dah tu, ni mama kata ambil buat. Ini siapa? Kalau mama ini bank, ni mama ni, ni bagi api kiri pada ni kaya kerana, kamu, apa dah nama ni? Gota ke social media campaign ni kerap buat kat dia, kerap kerap buat dia. Nah, sajit nisbah ada ni kan? Ini nisbah ada ni, alami kerana ni, market ni. Ini kerana dia ni sajit kira ni dia ni ikhlas loh, mana? Mana dia ni? Ini apa dah ni? Samar itu kita dah sese kata apa? Samar dia berdiri tu na. Kamu ini mulu kata apa yang mana? Ini kerana kaya lah kerana, ini kerana point ni. Kalau ni ini kaya apa ni? Tahu point ni kerana tahu. Kamu ini mana? multimodal-удатив福 Ini payah, kita tak ada ini orang. Ini boleh mohon tak? Namun, ikan, ni lada ni pun orang ikan. Tiada orang yang mohon, cuma moment tiada highlights. Ini wokah, repackage tu lagi. Apa ni pun orang? Apa hilang tak? Kita hilang ni dalam hari ini ada dua orang. Kita tu macam ini, bar ini, bar ini dia. Apa pun ada dua orang tu. Kita kan sangat cakap tiada pun orang. Hari ini kami incar, hari ini kami incar. Social media pun orang incar hari. Ia sama, ini orang kita, kita hanya hari ini hari ini dah orang nak bela orang kan. Takkan cakap dengan mata kita kini orang pun. Hari ini nak takkan orang. Thank you very much. I think just to uh, close off, I'll just ask one question for Mr. Bimala Ratna. I think you represent the youth uh, in this campaign. So in terms of driving more youth to entrepreneurship and uh, so on and in the near future, what sort of policy or what sort of strategies would you employ once you get elected, hopefully as a member of parliament? Hopefully. Basically, I think Basically, I think we need to really look at the key resources that we have today. I'm not talking about our natural resources. I'm talking about our people. And especially when it comes to the youth, I think you know we need to focus on the one thing: education, education, education. 
but not the kind of education that's available today. Because our education system is so outdated, and it's basically pre historic. Creating basically educated students who has you know, like lost grasp of reality. They are masters of their field, but step one centimeter out of that, they are clueless. And even in our education system, I think you know like we are not really we really don't have a job focused or employment focused uh, kind of education. We are still following the same old, you know, like hacked methods, you know, doctors, lawyers, engineers. But yeah, that is outdated. You know, like most of these white collar jobs will not really get, you know, like make you a good living. Nowadays, you know, like you need to think about more skilled ways. Like, see, doctors are no longer in demand, but nurses are, welders, motor mechanics, things like this. You know, like that's where I think our future is. So I think what we need to do is focus more on education and get our people to think differently, get technology involved in uh, our education and invest more in R&D, that sort of thing. I think that's where you know we should really look at, you know, like not giving loans for to people, like, like I do not believe in the welfare state. So we just need to get our skilled people out there because you know, like, look at our number one um, revenue generator. We are sending housemates. Right? I am not against not sending people abroad, but I want them to be skilled. Some you know, people who can actually make real money, not even doing menial labor. So I think we need to have like, see, I don't believe in overnight change. We need to have, as a country, we need to have a minimum 50 years plan. Not like, you know, plan that changes every five years or you know, every time you talk and change. So we need to be realistic, we need to come up with a longer term um, plan and I think the only way we can do it is through education. And education in this country needs to change and you know, we should stop, especially you know, like making fighting bulls kind of thing. You know, like because look at our education system, what, what, look at the kind of people, you know, intellectuals that we are creating today. Yeah, they are, they, are, they are educated. You are exactly right. That you are exactly right. Look at you know, like look at you know the so-called intellectuals. They have no humanity because from year one itself, we have driven the humanity out of our children. Correct. You are starting from you know like okay, you need to do better than the next guy. You need to be better than the next guy. Do well at the scholarship exam. Get into a better school. So it's it's not you know it's not even a. You should even wonder why, you know, like when they go into university, they behave like animals. Take Reddit, for instance. You know, like they they go getting there, you know, like going to hell, and they make life miserable for the same class of people. Because most of the university students come from like a very hard background, and when they get to the second year, they make life living hell for the same, you know, kids that came from the same kind of backgrounds. We need to change our education. And that is, I think that is one of the root causes of our social decline. Uh, sorry to grab the mic again. Uh, all this communication strategy, but I'm going to go across the Then, you say about the right. I'm going to have a new discussion about it. After the summer, the Mitra Shili, the channel will power. Then Jimu Sanji Thunder was a key way. Then RMCC again, I remember. I'm a tractor. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not ट्रैक्टर 
that is going around his mind, the landing from the plane, and yeah. you're worshiping yeah. the flow, and the entire rural community yeah. is basically on it. But with the Shah, there is something like this. Uh, for like uh, Rahil Vikramasinghe, there was no slandering of his image, like his education, things like that. But for Sajid sir, especially, that is the line they are taking. Yeah, so yeah. We, are, yeah, we, are not, we, are, we have to address that. Yes. No, I mean, look, this is a guy who attended one of the most exclusive English public yeah, schools. Now, why don't we take that? I mean, there must be photographs in his home, there must be, you know, stuff, there's stuff, right? Doctor, yeah. doctor, the, what, what these people don't understand is, I think he was, he left when he I think he was a million or something, right? Yeah. And so million. Million. Yeah. Yeah. Here when you are left, and we are talking about uh, all of us. You don't have people over. Let's see, million, he was a million. Definitely. And if you get cricket, cricket, he won a political science prize. These things should be marketed. Exactly. No, I, I, and then at the LSE, and then when he went to the, the United States for his internship, yeah. that's how so he doesn't say it, we don't say it, nobody says it. Yeah. And, and yeah. you have to prove it, so you have to get the stuff. Yeah. And it has to be a nice, yeah. nicely packaged, uh, exactly. you know, very quick, fast moving thing. But that's and not being done. Another final thing is uh, all these candidates should have their profile printed and then distribute to all the houses, you know, your profile. I have advised some of the candidates, you know, but I think SJB should, should uh, advise all the, all the candidates, you know, to show their education and their family background. You know, the doesn't have to be very long one. Hanka Dahade in Samabitana Balade again. Follow me. In number only Eram. Kurunagala District Gate Jeshtanai Katwea. JC Alavatuala. Anka Hatta. Samaki Janapala Vekia. Manat Ikagai. Essen Maika. Anka Atta. Kurunagala District Gate. Samaki Janapala Vekia. ृष्ट 